All right. Calling to order this meeting of the Montero Water and Sanitary District Board of Directors. It is May 7th. We're calling it to order at uh, 7.50. Can we have a roll call, please? Director Slater Carter. <coughs> Present. Director Harvey. Here. Uh, Director uh, Boyd. Here. Director Wilson. Here. Director Huber. Here. All right. Uh, all present and accounted for. Uh, President statement. Um, well, we had little sprinkles of rain today. I just want to commend our community one more time for being the water conserving community that it is. Um, you'll see numbers reported from around the state about how wonderfully conserving everyone else is. Uh, we're taking a good hard look at some of those numbers and how they compute them. What we know is that our numbers here in Montero are truly uh, reflective of the conservation efforts of our community. And um, we can hold our heads high knowing not only do we <coughs> conserve water, but we've spent over the past few years uh, considerable effort to become a, uh, a sustainable uh, sustainable water system. And during this time of state drought, uh, we have something very solid to rely on. All right, with that, um, any oral comments on items not on the agenda? Uh, you'll come to the mic. Leonard Warren, uh, board president of the Granada Community Services District. At our last meeting, which should have been our regular meeting, but it was a week late because of unavailability of council on the regular meeting date, um, we had a presentation of the um, compiled survey results um, where we had surveyed the community for what uh, uh, the needs and desires were for parks and recreation facilities. And um, it was uh, compiled um, by a district resident, uh, Pat Tierney, a professor at San Francisco State University Parks and Recreation Department, who has extensive experience involving park surveys and analyzing statistical data. Professor Tierney contacted the district to volunteer his time and expertise to this project, which was gratefully accepted. And we think he did a really good job compiling it. Um, and so you can uh, catch that on the, the video, which uh, I think there's one more showing on the cable channel, and then it's generally available on YouTube also. Um, and it, it's pretty interesting. Um, the, one of the, the big takeaways for me was that there's very strong support for um, basically uh, undeveloped parkland, you know, ad hoc space, and even totally undeveloped land. and and unpaved trails. Um, so basically the, the really natural setting type stuff, there's, there's heavy support for that. And um, one notable thing, the 16 to 19 year olds want bike trails. <coughs> Thank you. They don't want paintball places? Uh, I don't recall that um, being in the survey results, but we, we haven't gotten all the detail with all the, uh. the handwritten in comments. So, you know, we'll, we'll know more when he's finished compiling it. This was uh, basically uh, uh, preliminary results that he presented. So it will be available in print? Yeah, it's not on the website yet because he still is fine-tuning it. Um, I had asked him to normalize the results, and he is not going to do that because he says most people don't know what normalize means. Um, but basically and, the and besides that people in El Granada aren't normal the response rate was was higher among older people and so to That's normalize normal. it what you would do is increase the weight of the results from the younger people since they didn't respond at the same rate but he doesn't want to do that because it's too hard to explain the math okay. thank you um, do we have any other public comments? <coughs> Uh, let me mention, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, uh, the board met in closed session uh, starting around 6.30 uh, for a, what was agendized, which was conference with labor negotiator. And uh, no action was reported out. All right, moving on, consent agenda. Any directors wish to pull items for consideration? <coughs> Hearing none, can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Captain and twice. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. It's five to zero. 
Old business item one, review of sewer authority Midco site budget. So we presented the um, sewer authority Midco <coughs> site budget. So it's actually uh, a number of budgets, at least two, um, depending on how you're going to look at those. Uh, to, uh, we presented those at the last uh, meeting in April. And um, that was an initial um, but uh, that was already an approved budget that was sent out by SAM to the member agencies for review and actually approval. However, now the SAM board at their uh, last meeting in April um, actually made, agreed to some revisions to the uh, SAM o &M budget. Uh, so we actually now have a new version, a revised version in front of us. And uh, real quick here, a summary that was uh, transmitted to us um, about the revisions. <coughs> there are $5,000 to be added to uh, the first flush line item that is um, related to laboratory testing costs uh, center. Um, then $15,000 to be added to the engineering services budget that is um, essentially an update to the recycled water study from 2008. This is the thought is to fin uh, finalize this. Uh, this will be done by SRT. And then also $150,000 uh, to be added to the engineering services budget that's for CEQA permitting uh, costs. All those um, line items are essentially uh, related to the recycled water um, project that SAM is um, currently, uh, all, and all member agencies are uh, currently trying to implement as fast as possible. Uh, and on top of that, there is $25,000 to be added uh, to the engineering services budget, and that is uh, for a comprehensive hydraulic modeling uh, study for the entire SAM system. So uh, what this now does to um, Montero specific, the percentage of co allocation, of course, doesn't change. We saw that the um, assessment will go up for Montero, and that is due to um, in the own M budget now flow, and that number is uh, in, in over 20 percent. So I'm, I'm actually looking for the numbers. Here it is. So so we'll on the assessment comparison. So so we'll see actually our <coughs> assessment essentially increase from the 14. From the current budget of $624,000, the proposed budget would go up to $750,000. So it's a significant increase of 20.3%. And we don't have in front of us tonight the uh, collection system budget, but uh, we saw also an increase in hours. And uh, we presented those numbers the last time. And uh, so the collections budget is. Uh, scheduled for us to go up from around $300,000 to $360,000. Uh, the SAM budget essentially will need to be approved um, in a timely fashion before July 1. Um, so um, the Sewer Authority Mid Coast side uh, needs the resolution by the June meeting. That gives us two further meetings to review and um, adopt a SAM budget. So at this time, we plan to further review the SAM budget and also then allow for further discussion at a later meeting. Do we have any public comment? Yes, public no, yes. <coughs> Did he, has he filled out slips? I don't see any speaker slips. <laughs> we'll, we'll get one filled out for you. I just I want to make sure that his name is for the record. Yes, of course. Um, okay, we'll fill that out afterwards. Um, okay. Here, here it is. Take a cookie with it. <clears throat> um, what I'm distributing is a page out of the, um, uh, the union MOU that's currently in effect. Uh, on, for the record, Leonard Warren, um, 
and I'm speaking as a director of GCSD and as a director of SAM not speaking for either agency. Um, so wait, wait, who are you speaking for, Leonard? I'm speaking as a director of the two agencies, but not for either agency. So he's speaking as an individual in spite of the fact that he's... He just who happens to have two director hats. All right. I left one in the car. We don't have one. We don't what have he's one. saying is he's not speaking on behalf of either right. agency. Um, so uh, I, I want to start with um, uh, a, a paragraph in the cover letter for the staff report to the GCSD board um, for the SAM agenda. Um, and what our general manager writes is, of note in the budget, total O&M and collections, productive payroll is budgeted at $1,396,862, a 24% increase over the past three years average payroll expenditure, and benefits is budgeted at $618,533, a 15% increase over the past three years benefits expenditures. Um, the, this this is a, a, an unsustainable rate of increase, um, and I, I'm not sure why he did it over three years. Because when I looked at it uh, at Sam, it was actually 24 percent over two years, and some people are <coughs> saying that's because of changes in in staffing. The technical services supervisor has retired, but we're hiring an engineer, which is uh, in terms of headcount, um, uh, you know, one-to-one -one replacement. I don't know what the engineer will cost relative to the uh, retired technical services supervisor, but they're probably going to be similar salary numbers. And um, this 24 percent includes the addition of um, a treatment operator that. Um, my recollection is the board directed that it be added as a side item in the budget and not integrated into the budget, but it was. And so our general manager says that that probably accounts for about 4 percent. Uh, he didn't do the uh, exact arithmetic, but off the top of his head, uh, he said that's probably 4 percent of that 24 percent increase. So we still have a problem with the 20 percent. And so now if, if you look at the MOU, one of the things that was done is the um, uh, general manager at SAM who just uh, left the agency um, uh, computed the annual salary increases for the represented employees uh, incorrectly. Um, the, the MOU, and there's two separate paragraphs, I drew an arrow on the, the one that is coming up, but you, you see above it is, is the, the one that applies to the year we're currently in. And um, the, the, the increase in total compensation was supposed to be limited to the two numbers you see there, 3.75% effective July 1st and 3.75% effective, um, that was July 1st, 2014, then 3.75% effective July 1st, 2015. And what that meant is that whatever money wasn't required to um, take care of the increase in health care and increase in retirement costs was available for uh, a wage increase. But the general manager computed the wage increase based on total comp and gave them all of that as an increase in wages. And then we still have on top of that 3.5% um, 3 <coughs> last year and 3.75% coming up. On top of the 3.5% salary increase, wage increase, we also have the increase in health care costs and the in increase in retirement costs. And so that, that's why our total comp costs are going through the roof here, because th these were comp uh, uh, computed wrong. Um, and so one way or another, I think we need to deal with that. So because of this, uh, I feel that I have to recommend to my board, and this is why I'm speaking here now, I feel that I have to recommend to my board that we do not approve the budget as presented. And I don't know how we're going to fix it, but I don't see how we can approve it as presented. Thank you for your consideration. All right. Thank you. Okay, board um, discussion. 
Well, I appreciate uh, Director Warren's um, investigation into this, and I would recommend that you ask your accountant to justify it. Okay. Well, I serve as the treasurer for Sam, so <coughs> I uh, will be having some conversations. Um, <coughs> any and all information that you have would be useful for that conversation. I have another spreadsheet I'll send you. Thank you. I mean, my biggest concern right now, you've got a management issue that you're addressing. So <clears throat> I would actually be interested in see what the revised budget would be after you manage that change. And then I think that will probably be more realistic at the budget anyway. So. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm, I'm somewhat inclined towards. <clears throat> um, Rob had teed up a number of changes, all of them, much of which we were very excited about. But without him there to manage us through those changes, um, I'm feeling a lot more conservative and you know we had something that worked pretty well last year so aside from anything that we actually put into force um, staying steady through this transition seems to be the you know, priority yeah so um, just for those of you who aren't aware um, uh, unfortunately our general manager at SAM uh, had need to uh, attend to other matters, and uh, we were sorry to see him go, but uh, we're going through a transition period right now. Um, I will report that uh, the board, uh, <clears throat> the SAM board met Monday night. Uh, we are looking at candidates for the interim general manager position. Uh, that has not gone well, uh, just in terms of uh, um, we don't have anyone identified, we thought we did, uh, but uh, our most recent candidate had to withdraw because they simply are being too successful in the consulting business and don't have enough time. And I thought it was, our last candidate was very um, straightforward with us and actually came a fair distance to, to let us know. I thought it was a very stand-up thing to do, but it didn't leave us with anyone to fill the position. So the board acted Monday night to appoint uh, an acting general manager, uh, because it is necessary that the agency have someone who can execute contracts and take charge of uh, emergencies and uh, to sign certain kinds of checks. <clears throat> so uh, uh, the board acted to uh, appoint Clemens to be the acting manager for what we hope is going to be a very short period, just so we have someone who can take that magic pen. Um, we are working diligently to get a, an interim manager in place and also firing off the, um, the process to go recruiting for a full-time general manager. So we have a lot on our plates right now. Uh, we have an excellent crew uh, and office staff who are there to keep things moving and working, and uh, we are counting on them. Uh, we have Tim in the audience who is in leadership now at SAM and uh, has been one of one of several working diligently to keep this thing operating well. And, um, we have a lot of confidence in our people, but the board has a job to do to help bring some additional resources to bear as quickly as possible. All right. Well, we have some more work to do. A little bit of follow up. <clears throat> right. So, and I think the general um, consensus is that now Sam takes a very close look at those numbers and um, Leonard raised some good points. Uh, we, of course, will take uh, a close look at all those numbers and uh, the SAM board will <coughs> probably make some joint decisions um, mm -hmm. of how, how to go about this and going forward. Can you mention just a, a couple of points? One, <coughs> one is um, in terms of the uh, collections budget. This is Sam actually has kind of two different parts. Uh, one is the part that has the, has the staff <clears throat> that runs the office, has the crew that runs the plant, and then there's more crew that takes care of the, the collection system, which is all the pipes and pumps and whatnot that aren't on the main Sam property. Uh, so we have <clears throat> pumps and pipe in all three districts that are SAM owned and maintained. So the collections crew uh, is the one that takes care of that stuff. And each agency, each, each of the three agencies, Half Bay, Granada, and Montero, <coughs> uh, essentially contract 
as a separate arrangement for hours that are spent doing things like cleaning the lines and maintaining the pumps. And uh, the amount that each agency pays on that part of the budget is something that comes is arrived at through mutual understanding between each agency manager and SAM. So that's an area where uh, there's some room for, for us to directly influence what that, what that costs us. Uh, let me mention one other thing, and that is that uh, it came to light recently that uh, we were having some trouble, apparently, with some backflow uh, prevention devices here <clears throat> that looked like we were putting perhaps the same amount of water through the meters more than once. And if you look at our uh, flow numbers, in December, our flow numbers were up significantly over where they normally were. And then if you look back over a period of time, you'll see there's this slow, steady increase. And it may be, and it's one of these things that's hard to know for sure, but it may be one of these things where it started to fail slowly and got a little bit worse over time and a little bit worse over time. Um, a few years ago, uh, we had a situation where Granada saw the same kind of trend, and we spent quite a while doing a whole lot of investigation to try to figure out what's going on. Where are we seeing you know, a high water table with water seeping into the lines and Granada getting billed for that, or you know, what kind of thing was it? At the end of the day, what we found was that we had some flow meters that weren't working the way that we thought, and uh, got them all tuned up by professionals who came in and calibrated them properly, changed out some systems so it was more reliable, and back to normal. Well, now it's Montero's turn. Um, so one of the things that uh, I definitely intend to bring up as the sand board looks at this is um, how do we want to deal with something that winds up with Montero showing uh, owing a greater percentage of this budget than uh, is probably right? Uh, so whether or not we can <clears throat> figure that out, we had a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble figuring out was there anything equitable to do for Granada? Granada made it easy, essentially, for everybody by saying we're going to let some water go under the bridge. Uh, through the pumps, whatever. No pun intended. Uh, this is just something we'll have to talk about. I, I don't know that I have a particular outcome in mind, but we do need to discuss it. I just want to mention that uh, the flows in December, we should exclude from that discussion um, because we understand that there was some significant rain events and, and mm -hmm. those definitely have skewed the picture. So, so, so it's, it's one of these things where you, we're going to have to look at it really hard before we can figure out if it really means that we need to do something to the budget. But well, we've got some really good people on it, and we can sort through it. Let me get to Bill first. Okay, so uh, Scott, the <clears throat> I'm looking at that where it says Sewer Authority, Mid Coast Member Agency, JPA uh, assessment comparison, where it shows that uh, it changes by 10% for Half Moon Bay goes down almost the uh, percent for El Granada, or for Granada, and then goes up 20.3% for mm -hmm. us. Is this part of that issue, or is, that, or is this something altogether separate? We need to sit down with Clemens and uh, with some folks at SAM, I think, and look through this to figure this out. Now, for those who don't know, the way that, <clears throat> the way that, uh, the amounts that each agency owes is determined in a couple of ways. One is what I mentioned with the <clears throat> with the collections budget. It's a service that you contract for, so you pay as much as you use to oversimplify it. And then the other is uh, pretty much by flow or by ownership. So certain things should be allocated by what percentage each agency owns. Uh, uh, of the each agency owns a percentage, so we own what 20 percent, <clears throat> Granada yeah. owns 30, 29.5, 29.5, and Half Moon Bay owns 50.5. Right, um, so there are certain expenditures where it's allocated across that. Mm -hmm. uh, like if we built a new office building, we'd split it that way. Yeah, um, we're not planning to build a new office building, uh, but then <laughs> sorry, guys, that's uh, too bad. We, we did a, a remodel, what, 15 years ago? You know, that should last another, another 35 at least. Um, the other way that we, we spread the billing is based on flow. 
So every agency sends a certain <coughs> quantity of liquid, mostly to uh, Sam. And uh, what it costs to take that in and process it is split up based on your flow. So when we look at any one of these increases, we've got to tease yeah. out which parts are contributing to that. And so I don't want to try to give you an oversimplified answer on that. So if I can sort of paraphrase this, this may have some effect on that 20% figure, but it is not a uh, causal factor in and of itself. I think it's a potentially an influencer, probably yeah. to the tune of a few tens of thousands. That's my guess. Haven't run the numbers. And, yeah. and a lot of it's going to be speculation because if our, if our metering was, was incorrectly uh, if we're getting bad readings off of our meters because we're running the same fluid through it more than once, how are we going to know how much? Yeah. Right? Uh, we could look at where it is today and, and maybe measure that and try to work backwards from it, but then we, for, for us to actually do that, we'd have to get two other agencies to agree that that methodology works right. and it comes out of their pocket. So we, we've been through that drill before with Granada saying we want some money back and two yeah. other agencies going, mm. <clears throat> uh, some amounts aren't worth, you know, fighting over right. because, you know, there's some give and take. It's a partnership. Um, I will mention that the way the flows are calculated is fun because we don't have meters on every pump or on every line. Um, so Half Moon Bay, uh, their flow numbers, you would think, might be taken from some meters mm -hmm. that feed into the plant. Uh, ours are, and Granada's are, kind of. There's one line where there's no meter. The Frenchman's Creek. No, no, Frenchman's Creek doesn't have a meter. Uh, Granada doesn't have a meter either. Uh, we measure what comes out of Portola and subtract <coughs> your, your reading from here. Well, you've got a meter on Portola, but you don't have a meter on Frenchman's Creek. No, Sam has a meter on Portola. Uh, very good point. I take your point. I support your point. Uh, so there's fewer meters than you would think, and all of Half Moon Bay's numbers are computed based on the other two. So if one of us is off, Half Moon Bay is off by exactly the opposite amount. So you'll see these things where there's this huge difference, but it's actually the double of whatever the mistake was. Every mistake doubles. Well, uh, I, well, we have a long agenda, but I'm wondering whether yeah. we should send this when we have this budget to the budget. Yeah, I, I think this kind of clarification is good, but let's come back to this one. Yeah, I, I would just add just one final thing is that it seems like that's a uh, very important number to us, and we want to just make sure that it's correct. Yes, as best we can. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, Catherine, did you still have anything? No, you answered it. Thank okay. You. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Let's uh, move on to uh, Old Business 2, Receive Alta Vista Tank Construction. So this is the fun part of our show tonight, and um, we actually are going to... Uh, uh, Pan is over to Tim Monahan with SRT very soon, who has a, a presentation for us, a slideshow presentation. So we're going to take a minute to set um, really, really quickly up the, uh, the screen and projector. I need to go look and uh, get rolling on this. Good. Wow. Right. Come a long way. Let's use a Okay. I think it might be the machine to plant. Oh, is it? Yeah, I think it's totally. The machine is to Yeah. <laughs> and good work. That works. Well, we can leave. How's that? Okay. Here's that machine. They've already been. All right. They've already been. All yours. If I could see the dining room, it'd be better. Sure. Sure. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I'll, I'll keep the uh, presentation short because I, I know the meeting's running long and you guys were in closed session. And I want to get home and eat and so forth, but just want to give you a status update of the construction project up at the Alta Vista tank. Uh, we touched base about two months ago with you and we did a site walk, uh, and, but we've made a lot of progress since then. And so I just wanted to bring everybody up to speed and, and invite you all to another site walk at, uh, at, at some time in the near future, perhaps one of our next meetings. Um, let's see. Okay, again, everybody knows the project team. It's uh, uh, Western Water and DN Tanks are the, uh, are the two general, general contractor and subcontractor 
who are the main thrust of building this new tank. Again, 500,000 gallons, uh, pre-stressed reinforced concrete. Uh, we're expected to be done in December, and we are on schedule and uh, proceeding uh, very quickly uh, with uh, construction. Uh, last you saw it, when we did the site visit, we were just coming down to grade with uh, the, the retaining walls that were, uh, were suspending back uh, the earth so the contractor could get down to base. We have established uh, base elevation, put in the underdrain piping, uh, formed and <coughs> reinforced uh, the bottom slab, as you can see. As you can see in the background is a, is a well that will be coming up with us. This uh, takes in groundwater and any uh, leakage uh, would be an indicator of any leakage in the tanks would show up in that manhole. Uh, the, the slab doesn't look too complicated from a distance, but if you get up close and look at it, what you see are wires coming up with very heavy strands. These are for seismic cables that extend up into the walls to hold the tank to get on the slab. And I'll explain those a little bit more in a minute. On May 20th, just a couple weeks ago, we cast uh, the bottom slab. It was over 110 Wait, yard core. That would be April? Yes, that was testing you passed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be April 20th. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. I was worried. <laughs> I thought it'd last a couple of weeks. No, no, we don't want to lose weeks. A couple of days after taxes were due, we passed the slab and uh, successfully, and this is what, May 20th again. Did you, did you put your initials in it? Yeah. Uh, no, I was strongly encouraged not to. Okay. And then I'll explain why. It might be a stress crime. How, how, yeah. like how many tons of concrete is that? Uh, well, it was 110 so cubic yards. And mm -hmm. one cubic yard is about 4,000 pounds or two tons. So it's about 200 tons. Wow. 220 tons. Wow. Uh, so uh, this is what it looks like after the workers uh, completed casting the slab. So how thick is that piece? And I, my mind wandered when you told okay. me. Okay, the middle of the slab is approximately eight inches thick, but then toward the walls it increases to over a foot thick. And the reason being, you know, the cables you see, they extend down and they tie the wall in by extending into the slab in both directions. So if an earthquake hits, we can just uh, counteract it in any direction. So how thick are the walls going to be? The walls are going to be 10 inches wide, and then they're going to have two inches of sprayed concrete or short creep on the outside. Ah. Uh, and I have some interesting photos to show you. <coughs> Again, slab cast. Uh, what you see there with the orange uh, uh, tube on top of it, that's the water stock that will be the center of the 10-inch wall. The wires will be standing straight up, and they will be uh, in a, in a pre prescribed geometric pattern uh, sustaining the wall and tying into the rebar. Now, the rebar for the walls is assembled on the ground, contracted due to limited space, assembled the rebar um, mm -hmm. on the tank surface, then he lifts them up, and then he puts them into place. Wow. What you see, the white tubes uh, running from the top of the wall down to the bottom, <coughs> Those are post-tensioning uh, red rods, we call them. And this is what we use to put the wall into compression after we cast it. So not only will it be put into compression, but it also be put into tension by wrapping from the outside. The contractor then moves the crane down into the center of the tank. He suspended the rebar cages with post-tensioning rods against the wall. And the formwork has just arrived on site and is wow. being assembled now. Uh, the formwork is uh, assembled to the prescribed internal and external radius, or excuse me, diameter of the tank. And the next step will be casting the walls. We're scheduled for next Thursday or Friday casting the first wall sections. And then uh, we'll post tension them. Uh, we'll install the roof, of course, and then we'll hydroblast, and we'll apply the cable on the outside <coughs> of the tank, and then put a shot, shot creep application on the outside of the, uh, the wires that wrap around the tank, which will give us a finished product 12 inch, <coughs> 12 inch wide wall. Now, to 
it's easy to say this, but it's it's uh, even easier to watch it. So hopefully this works. This is a video. Now it's not working. <coughs> okay, this is this is a machine that'll be used. As you can see, this rides on a track at the bottom of the tank, and you'll see a spool of wire or a cable on the side. This machine pivots from the center of the tank and wraps the exterior of the tank with wire in, in a very wow. prescribed rate and pitch and tension. Okay, we don't want to see the next video there. We don't? We don't? No. <laughs> and what we do want to see, we do want to see this one too. After the wire or strands of cable are applied. The, the same machine travels around the tank and applies a very specific thickness of shot cream. It's concrete sprayed under pressure. And that builds up our 10 inch reinforced concrete wall to 12 inch. Wow. So this is when the construction of the tank gets very exciting. And <laughs> you're not supposed to oh, this there's that bottom right one for all the guys. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, well, it's, it's fun stuff. It's, yeah. Engineers love it. Um, okay, so we're getting the uh, walls constructed now in May. Uh, I have these dates, right? Uh, in next month, we'll be putting the roof on. Uh, that, that's going to be an interesting. It's a domed roof again. Uh, they'll be staging that from the inside. If I can interrupt just one engineering question. Uh, these months, this looks like exactly a month apart. How's our 28 day cure for that tightening? We have to wait 28 days to tighten that, those tension rods. It, it'll easily work. That it, these are forecasted dates, yeah. but. Is that what, do you have to wait to all those prescribed <coughs> dates for all the hardenings and everything? Well, we apply tension. We, we don't necessarily have to come up to the 28 days for the full uh, prescribed. Uh, to, to let everybody know, concrete rises to its maximum compressive strength at 28 days. So what we do when we cast new concrete is we take test <coughs> specimens, bring them to the lab, and we, and we crush them under compressive strength. We took samples of the concrete that was cast for the base, and we compressed uh, samples at three days, seven days, and 14 days. The three-day strength of the concrete, uh, the design strength was 5,000 PSI. We were already at 4,500 and 4,900 PSI at three days. So the strength comes up very quickly on this type of concrete. And we're, we're hoping that when we get to the 28-day breaks on the slab, we'll be well over 5,000, uh, probably in the 6,000 range. So to answer your que question, as long as our strength comes up, we can begin the compression of the walls. And then uh, it's going to take quite a long time to form up and uh, make the dome itself before casting. So we hope to get by the end of May the work done, and probably by the end, the far end of June, that's when we're casting the dome. The dome is a cast concrete, and it, it has to be done in sections. Uh, no, it, it'll be done in one monolithic pour. It's going to be similar to the similar to the base. So how do you keep the concrete from falling through? No, we, no, we, we they, they. Do you have a? Do you have like a like um, Mold. an inflatable kind of thing that <laughs> like that house in Hillsboro? <laughs> on, on, on 280? No, yeah. no, no. What, what, what we do? We, we do more more caveman style. We come up with staging on the inside, gotcha. and then we use plywood and form the dome from the inside. Uh, the tank manufacturers have this down for science. And it, they, they know how to bend the plywood to the right prescribed radius. And it's uh, it, it's it's very unique. <coughs> and I, I highly encourage them. I'd love to take everybody up for another show and tell when that happens. Because it, it's going to be really interesting. I'm not going to be here in June. Okay. Well,
Well, we can ask them to hold up. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tim, when you pour the walls, are you pouring one section at a time, or are you pouring all the way around? Good, and good, so good question. We're, we're pouring them in different sections. Uh, okay. What the contractor will do, we'll pour two sections on either side. Right. And then the bulkheads will be stripped down, and the, the remaining two sections will be poured separately. Okay. And that, that's because we want to limit the amount of shrinkage and cracking that might occur, you know, just in right. a mass concrete like that on a, on a relatively thin wall. We're up over 20 feet tall yeah. and we're only 10 inches wide. So how do you key the two pieces together? There's a... Uh, there's it's like a tongue and groove kind of thing? <laughs> essentially, essentially. There will be a keyway mm -hmm. with a, a, a water stop similar to the one we saw in the photo. Okay. It'll be running vertically and we'll make uh, the two sections join right. and provide water tightness. Okay. Mm. So, uh, again, contractor is doing a very good job. Uh, we're very pleased with the contractor who we, we, uh, we got on this job. Uh, they're very good with the paperwork, very good with the shop drawings and so forth, and very cooperative with us as far as uh, we ask them to do a few extra odds and ends here and there. And uh, that is about all I have for my presentation. Is there any Scott, more questions? can we get it on the website? Don't look at me. I don't run that thing anymore. Oh, darn. <laughs> <laughs> it's a question of comments. Okay. Okay. So like, we'll put a, a copy of the presentation. Yes. Yeah. I yeah, think that would be great. the latest version, I think, right? You would add it to the Uh, I, I did add a few. Well, you might not add May 20th, maybe? Yeah, you might, you might want to change it. Yeah, I'm going to change it right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we like your uh, capacity to sort of take what you're doing five days from now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, okay. That's <laughs> April. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I, I there were two of them. Yeah. Yeah. I will give you the. the I will give you this version. Of editors. There and you go. No pressure. Okay. I hate to go on vacation with you guys, but it's actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, turn here. Turn here. Yeah. Slow down. Speed up. Okay. How's that? That's good. Yeah. That was great. Okay. I'll be. I'll be email to you. Right now. So when it's full, how much does the waterway versus the tank? <laughs> hmm, good question. Okay. Five hundred thousand pounds. Sixty gallons. The correct answer is what we said. A gallon. Sixty. They're the same. Sixty-five pounds. Oh, eight pounds. Eight pounds. Yeah. So let's call it eight pounds per gallon times five hundred thousand. So five hundred thousand. So four million. Four million pounds. How much does the concrete weigh when it's all finished? Uh, you, you, just, all you get to really, you really want this to be your own little evidence tonight, don't you? Yeah. Why is that relevant to anything? It's, a, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's a math problem you can do at home. <laughs> yes. This is, but but when, you, when you think about it, though, the weight per square foot, our tank is approximately 22 feet deep. That's right. It changes the weight the bottom. But, but, but the weight per square foot is really not that much when you think about it. Concrete weight, I mean, the water weighs about 60 pounds per cubic foot times 20 feet high. That's about 1,200 pounds per square foot, which is really not a lot. Or 5,000 square feet. Yeah, it's quite open. Yeah, it's but it's you're looking at just one yeah. square foot. Yeah. 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 So. No, it's the earthquake. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, well that, that's why these walls are so intricately designed and, and more complicated than you know, your average wall. Is, is there a flexible EVA joint between the tank and the rest of the water supply? <coughs> yes. And and what what Pippin was asking is, uh, do we have a flexible connection between the pipes coming in and the pipes coming out? Yes. <coughs> They're very deep, too, so hopefully they'll, they'll never see any movement. But you never know. All right, that's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you, too. Sorry. Um, Sorry. Um, actually, they're doing concrete with 3D. That's great. I love good engineering. Yeah, he didn't yes. explain why. Okay. Uh, yeah. Why he wouldn't want to do that. I think with all the stresses, you have to be really careful about that. Yeah. Oh, look. There's more top lines. <laughs> Thank you.
Chasing Leonard, I can't de decipher these. Did you want to speak on any other topics? Yeah. 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 Holler if I blow past, okay? All right, new business item one, review of State Water Board drought year water actions. Okay, so the State Water Resources Control Board has now finaled their regulations uh, to implement the governor's ex executive order. It was over a long period, uh, over uh, almost two months, there were draft regulations out that have been reviewed by all agencies and uh, there was uh, many comments to those um, draft regulations submitted to the State Water Resources Control Board. Um, the uh, governor's executive order essentially says that um, California's water use, domestic water use, has to be reduced by 25% and the State Water Resources Control Board is now in charge of um, essentially implementing that executive order. At the time of the preparation of the staff report, we still had a draft, but it's my understanding that the draft essentially was approved. So that what you have in front of you is indeed now what is in effect. And what is in effect is essentially, um, uh, you probably heard through the news that uh, there is a tier system set up for urban water users. Uh, for example, our neighbors to the north and south are required to um, uh, reduce their uh, water consumption by 8% and um, uh, it goes up to as high as some agencies uh, even in, in the Bay, within the Bay Area have to cut back by 36% overall. Um, there is uh, this is based on per capita consumption and now the question really is what is per capita consumption and that's what uh, I think a lot of agencies are now scrambling to figure out uh, what that really means and how this is calculated. There's actually also some language in the regulations and there are certain agencies can calculate it one way, others a different way. The good news is we're not affected by this. We're not an urban water system. We're a small water system. Regulations for small water systems call for a much simpler uh, process, and that is that the small water systems either, either have to implement a 25% reduction in water use, or have to implement a restriction to auto irrigation to twice per week. Well, that's easy. Come on, Tara. So we're already there. I, I, we don't do it. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that uh, many in uh, uh, Montero and Moss Beach are currently watering twice per week, and and if there are some left, then we will make sure that uh, they won't be able to do that going forward. Uh, I think the general idea is very clear. California has to cut back on water uh, uh, usage. Uh, we live in California. We need to uh, contribute. We need to participate. This district has, in the past, in the past years, saved more than 25%. Um, if we look back to since we took over, um, it, it, it is a, a very significant amount that is over 25%. We did some uh, calculations on per capita usage. Again, there are always the questions, how is this calculated? Uh, for example, in those calculate, we, we're coming up essentially with around 55 gallons per capita per day. Now, um, that number, for example, still includes unaccounted water loss. Um, other agencies subtract that. So we could be better um, if we calculate in the commercial usage we would come up to 60 gallons. So this is, this is all a range, but we're well within um, 
the uh, low within the range of the being you know a, a very low uh, having a very low per capita water usage in the district. Uh, what we're pl we're planning to bring forward a resolution <coughs> that uh, manifests the uh, restriction to a maximum of, of twice uh, outdoor, outdoor irrigation of twice per <coughs> week in the district. But the thought here is to um, uh, encourage a discussion between the board to see if there are may maybe other restrictions that the board would implement or not. Um, uh, one restriction, <coughs> for example, that uh, would be fairly easy to uh, implement and also enforce, because we're talking about mandatory restrictions, would be an, um, a prohibition to irrigate during certain times of the day, let's say between 9 and 4, for example. Um, but that is really a discussion that uh, I think we would like to see right now. Um, right, the, essentially, we are mandated to implement one restriction, and we've explained what that is. If there's a desire to uh, <coughs> further encourage conservation, we actually have some uh, we actually have some items up <coughs> that at a late at, at this agenda that. Um, uh, have this effect, we, uh, for example, ask for an, in, an increase in the um, uh, amount that we can budget for our rebate program, and uh, we would like to increase the amount that we would uh, issue for low flow toilets. Um, that's an item that's up later for tonight. That would be uh, something that would encourage conservation. We have an item up that uh, will also discuss our um, refund policy when it comes to outdoor leaks. Um, we can leave those discussions to a later point, but we are going to take some actions to encourage conservation further. Um, and now the question is, do we want to go with what were required on the mandatory restrictions, or do we want to be uh, a bit more stringent on this? Is one of the options um, looking at maybe I realize under 218, our tiers have to be justified by um, what the cost to provide that water is. But given given the um, drought situation, is there a way that we can? I know Governor Brown is is saying if you don't have tiers, you know you're violating his law anyway. Um, and is there a way to look at, at how to change our rate structure a little bit so we keep the <coughs> bottom tier where we wanted to, but maybe take the top two tiers a little bit higher? Well, um, I, I wouldn't say that this is not a possibility, but this district just evaluated its rate structure right. literally at the last meeting. And um, so, Whenever this comes up, we say if you need to, uh, if there is a desire to evaluate the rate structure, we need a rate study. Yeah. We just went through a lengthy rate study. So if that is the desire of the board, then we will ask for you know, months of preparation and Can also we get a little, just, a, just a little amendment to it, so it doesn't need a whole rate study, but you know. Just you know, I wonder if we should, I, I just have a recommendation. I mean, I think, first of all, by every measurement, we've been pretty good at conserving water, correct? We also, our water is self-contained. We're not drawing from a larger system that is under stress. Correct. And yes. we've got a couple initiatives that will promote water saving, you know, the rebate that we have in the budget and some of those discussions. Yes. I mean, my reality is why do we have to do more than the, than the was required? I, I just see absolutely no rationale given the history of this district and the past history we do, other than, you know, it, it, it's even hard for me to compel, given our weather, mm -hmm. we may lose more in evaporation at night than during the daytime, just given the fact that the temperature deviation is practically zip. That's right. But, but I, 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 I see that our glass is half full. We're not doing any more than we're doing now. Two times a week, it, it, I mean, a lot of us don't do any irrigation. 
I, I, don't, I think it's I, I think it's a it's a good deal. So you know we're not. Um, how many people? Do well, my the, point are the is, I, 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 I hate to get us into more mandates. I think yeah. I'd like us to do whatever we do. I'd like it to be based on education, promotion, and mm -hmm. positive reinforcement, and not use any restrictive limitations. I, I agree. That's really where I'm going. We, with we this. don't want to yeah. be the hose, please. I, I have no interest in doing that. Well, uh, why I agree with you? I have a question on this. These are mandatory, right? The, the yes. Two times per week mandatory. Two. Well, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the restriction is man mandatory. Restriction you don't have to. You don't have to irrigate twice. <laughs> right. <laughs> can, can we be clear? So the state requires that we do something, correct? Yes. Right. And what you're proposing is something that we can do, which doesn't really seem to change much about what our community is already doing, but it would it would put into a regulation. Right behavior that's already pretty uniform across our district, correct? Right. Correct. So it meets the requirement of the state right. and the spirit of what's already happening in the district and because our community has been so exceptional, I, I'm grateful that, that you know, as it was originally announced, if we were forced to cut back by 25 percent, uh, Clements actually had a conversation with somebody at uh, the Department of Health agreed that this could lead to a serious health and safety issue because we're already pretty tight. So I'm really grateful that the state regulations uh, were modified. We were not the only agency concerned that had done conservation. Quite a few spoke up and said, wait a minute, we don't want to be punished for having been ahead of the curve on, on conserving. Can I yes. Real quick, oh, I, wanted, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I wanted to uh, essentially just mention that that um, point I really picked up from Jim Harvey who mentioned in a prior meeting that you know we would be getting into a health and safety situation mm -hmm. if we would cut back by 25 percent. Comments, I just wanted to ask, um, so to be clear, all people in the district have, can only irrigate uh, twice a week? Does that include well owners? It, th that's up to the county. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm going hand, to I'm gonna hand this question over to Dave, but before <laughs> I do this, before I do this, there is clarity that on top of what we're actually asked, there is some restrictions that apply to all Californians, and those are also listed in um, the, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, written down here as well in this um, regulation, and that includes now all well owners. And those are also, you know, pretty common sense sins, like uh, application of potable, potable water to outdoor landscapes in a manner that causes runoff is prohibited, right? There is uh, the mention of a shut-off uh, nozzle on a hose when you wash a motor vehicle. I want to point out, you shouldn't wash a motor vehicle. It's actually discour uh, uh, in, it's discouraged in our... Um, in our drought contingency uh, plan in the stage one that we have in place right now, we ask all car owners to wash their cars in a car wash that recycles the water. Um, the uh, application of potable water to clean driveways is prohibited. The uh, use of potable water in a fountain or de other decorative water feature is prohibited. Um, then uh, irrigation within 48 hours of measurable rainfall is prohibited. Uh, and the serving of drinking water in restaurants um, without the customer requesting it is also prohibited. And a number of um, other uh, restrictions that don't affect private folks. But um, those are in effect for all water users in California, so so I can be very clear that those also affect the well owners in our case. The mandatory restrictions that we have to put in place, are they affecting the well owners? Right, and the question is who enforces the regulations? <clears throat> and uh, from the standpoint of uh, the legal requirement, uh, we're uh, required to uh, enforce uh, in the uh, twice a week uh, irrigation limitation, you have the authority to add a, additional restric restrictions if you want to. There, uh, as Clemens has mentioned, there are 
actually uh, in place, but the question is uh, how effective are they if they're to be regulated by the, the state or the county. So it's, it's a local regulation that really counts, you know. Yeah. Okay, so what are we mandated that we have to do as far as enforcement, and, and how do we do that? We can, we'll prepare an ordinance for you to adopt, and the ordinance will simply say that uh, uh, irrigation of landscaping shall be prohibited except for two days per week. That's, a par a par walk. that's paraphrasing. That will, you walk? Will, will it have any uh, required enforcement steps, or is that left up to staff? Well, that would be punishable as a misdemeanor. And I think there's but a it, fine. Well, however, however I, I think what you're getting at is <clears throat> do we have how, how strict and punitive yeah. does it have to be in order to meet the... I mean, for example, I know I, in listening to stories on the radio, people were talking about there's going to be a stern finger wag, probably a written notice, uh, maybe a second warning before any kind of you know, uh, severe consequences come to any property owner in a lot of other agencies. You know, all, all laws are passed with the assumption that they will be voluntarily obeyed. <laughs> okay. <And Oops. laughs> when, it, when, it, excuse me. <clears throat> when it comes to enforcement, quite frankly, as a practical matter, it's, it's not unlike, it would not be, would not be unusual to have a, a neighbor call a district and say, my neighbor's watering and on it three in the afternoon, you know, and the water's running down the street and so forth and so on. So then and we'll tell them to call the sheriff. I, I think what the state of California is requiring, I mean, the minimum is what is they, we have to take the step, we have to show compliance with the act of doing the thing. Right. So yeah. There's nothing in there that says that we have to do anything more than that. That's right. And I think on these systems that are in tier systems, yeah. particularly they have a user, they probably are going to hire folks to run around and do whatever. Yeah, the, the question that Clemens put to you is whether you want to add some other restrictions yeah. as well. But uh, mm -hmm. the impression I have from your discussion so far is that you're satisfied with just the, 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 the one mandated uh, rule. Well, the reports that I have gotten from people in town are. <clears throat> They've decreased their showers. They don't flush their toilets as often. I mean, they've already put in their own mandatory uh, personal decisions on how to reduce water. I have a question for Pippin, and how is this going to affect Sam? Uh, don't you need a certain amount of water flow to, because of the um, strength of what's being processed? You have to change the um, bacteria in, in Sam? And, yeah, Tim's there too. Yeah, so I don't know you directed who. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of the chemicals and so forth that are purchased are based on <clears throat> on the solids that are getting to the plant, and the solids are largely going to be the same. So okay. There, there, it, there is going to be moderate reduction in pumping. That's a benefit to the system. Um, uh, the plant, you know, less water is helpful. If you get if it gets really, you know really small, then they, they just change their, their internal processes to some degree. But the plant has different uh, tiers inside, some duplicate equipment, so you know they don't have to have all the equipment online necessarily to, to make the flow, or they can slow the flow down to increase the performance. It's so interesting. I don't think it'll really make, yeah. the bottom line is that we'll, you'll probably have a similar chemical costs and maybe a little less electrical pumping uh, Dave Dixon costs. publicly said that, that they've already met their 8% reduction in essentially are in their positions that their conservation methods have pretty much met their goals. So he's he's basically telling, he, he did this in a public forum the other day that as long as they keep their conceptive where they are now, they're, they're, they're essentially done. Because I think they're on the 8%, if I recall correctly. But they've not done nothing about the watering twice a week? Well, they, they're going to have to do that. <coughs> but their 8% goal, if I okay. where they were, is pretty much the heat, heat that yeah. they're pretty well yeah. Their requirement is the eight percent, and they have to figure out how to do that. And we we have a different uh, requirement. So, so twice. A so that uh, we would be legally compliant if we set this policy up and call it a day. Right. 
pretty much. Or a knight. Okay. <laughs> well, that's so it. do I hear consensus from the board that that's? Uh, I, I guess we yeah. have direction and uh, yeah. do do what we have to do. Yeah. We'll do what yeah. we have to do. Oh, well, we have it for board direction <laughs> only. You don't hear any pushback on the on the proposal, as far as I can tell. But but it seems like to me that we're also all in agreement that we want this to be basically to acknowledge the efforts that everybody's putting to this point. And so uh, these restrictions, in a way, are a reward for, for doing such a good job of it. It's a funny, funny set of words to put together. But yeah. <laughs> okay, we want to be very positive about right. our contribution. Exactly. Acknowledging, <coughs> acknowledging the conservation of the has long been famous for. All right, uh, let's go on to item two, review and possible action concerning MWSD draft budget. Okay, so um, we've prepared a uh, draft budget and uh, Mace Associates has, uh, has uh, played a, a big role in this this time. Um, as you recall, <coughs> last year was the first year where um, we actually involved our accountants in the development of the budget. And uh, I think this was a uh, success because this time around, um, this looks like it's going to be, a, a, I think, a fairly smooth process. Um, and we have also Peter Medina here from Mays. if there should be any questions coming up. This is a draft that is a very initial draft. So the first thing that I have to point out is that the main drivers um, essentially haven't been um, you know, verified, uh, we aren't available. And uh, what I mean with that is, for example, the sewer service charges are based on flows. Uh, we just essentially transferred that to um, Fred Weber's office, who's doing the, uh, the calculate flow calculations <coughs> for us. So we don't know for certain if um, the, uh, uh, the what we need to do to collect the sewer service charge amount that is currently in the budget. So that's a number that we will have to revise and we will have to have a discussion about. Um, uh, the same on the water side, the, on, on the income side, the um, water income, uh, that, that is also always um, something that I think that we uh, look very much to for direction. We will provide a, a, a best estimate on water sales numbers but it's always a question on you know how much do we see do we anticipate water consumption to drop in the district it's going to be an interesting question this time around um, uh, the, um, there, there's a, a three percent water rate increase planned on the water side is this going to um, result in a further reduction all those <coughs> questions we will really have to dive into. Um, what we also don't have are really the uh, two main drivers, which is the Water Capital Improvement Program and Sewer Capital Improvement Program. Uh, those have been historically uh, almost the size of the operation budget or for example, this year on the water side, um, we, we essentially have a much larger capital improvement program because we're building a tank mm -hmm. uh, than our operations budget. The um, CIPs uh, haven't been finaled, but we're still working with the engineers on the capital improvement programs. <coughs> what we have plugged into the draft budget right now are num our numbers that are coming from the rate study. So we you know, also worked with the engineers on with, at least on the water side, worked with the water engineer on, uh, on the mm -hmm. development of, uh, of an estimated CIP for the uh, rate study. Now we have to take a close look and see um, how do we want to build the CIP for the next year. Um, also, um, you know, a, a question that we will have to have uh, have to discuss is the number of connections that we will sell. That's a that's a new discussion that we have since now two years, um, and uh, we have also numbers from the rate study that were partially utilized, and actually we also utilize trends um, uh, for those numbers currently. 
But uh, in essence, what we would what we would like to show the board tonight is that we're working on it, that we're um, ready to develop this further to present this on the May twenty first meeting in a, uh, in a in a more refined version, and that we are um, very confident that on the June fourth meeting we can pass a final budget. And uh, with that, I. Might I might hand it over to Peter and see if, if there's anything else that you want to say right now before the board Good. has some questions. No. <clears throat> Please. No, I don't. I mean, um, pretty much sum that up. Um, we we met. I came up here last week and and I had. This really started from the mid-year budget review, uh, getting the getting the template in place, and uh, I'm using that format to then get another three months of data input and just see where it's how it's tracked, and then uh, we're gonna try and project out the next three months. We, you know, at this point, we'll have another month of data when we really try to hammer this out over the next coming weeks. Um, so, now. Um, <coughs> input from Clemens, um, like I said, the major drivers of, of the budget, the CIP side um, for, for both water and sewer and uh, rates for both sewer and water have not quite been nailed down, so it's hard to really project that. But overall, though, both water and, and sewer um, expense side are, are for, the mo for the most part, going down um, from, from, from based on trends as well as this year's activity. Um, the district has been doing a superb job of keeping costs down, is what I see on a monthly basis. Um, we are beating budget uh, on, on most all categories. There are some outliers, but we have reasons for those. But by and large, we are, we are beating budget. So it's positive. I've taken that into account and reduced numbers uh, um, and gone back and forth with Clinton as far as saying, no, I think it should be. I, I have a good feeling this is what it is. I mean, Clemens always has the, you know, he'll have the final call because he knows better than I do um, where 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 these numbers should probably be at. But um, like I said, overall, what I'm seeing is the trend is downward. So, um, on the expense side, the revenue side is up. Um, much more connections, uh, much more fees in relation to those connections. So, like I said, um, it's it's looking good. Before we hand it over to the board, I wanted to just mention that the staff recommendation for this item will be to refer the draft budget to the finance committee for review. For more so work. It, it, okay. and, I, and I would just add one other thing that, uh, uh, Peter, I don't know if you did this intentionally or not, but uh, as a result of our strategic uh, planning, uh, one of the items in there was to uh, enable effective board and public oversight of finances through effective and understandable financial reporting and the change that you made to the way that this is all compiled uh, I think makes it uh, uh, much easier to understand much more transparent and so uh, that is uh, uh, actually an integral part of this budget is to that that change in how we lay it out how you laid it out so it's much clearer and and easy to understand. I appreciate that, Bill, because um, yeah, and, and as well as you and I discussed that as well. You know, last year's budget, where um, thinking that, that that I'm doing this service to you know, get as much detail as I can, I believe missing the mark as and in terms of producing a book and uh, you know maybe be inundated with data. Yeah. Um, decided to simplify it this year, and uh, you know, I, the one-page view on both sides, I I, I believe is the was where. The, the best visual as far as uh, how we look at it. As I discussed in the mid-year budget review, it's not just the operations, it's not just the, the non-operations side. Um, there are some items that are balance sheet activities that cannot be budgeted, and if you pick those up when we look at it at the, uh, at the cash flow level. So. <clears throat> so it goes to the finance committee. That's what we would like you to do. <clears throat> That sounds right to me. I'll make a motion to do that. Uh, well, I think we can give direction to staff, so okay, yeah. if everybody's all right with that. Yeah. 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 All right. Catherine, do you have anything to add? No. Okay. I Good. think we, we're going to, I think this is much easier to work on. And, and um, certainly my intent 
when I became treasurer was to um, make things less wonky and more of it more transparent to the public because I struggled with our budgets for years when others were doing them. So, well, thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, let's let's move on to item three: new business to review and possible action concerning MWSD sewer staffing assessment. So, um, the uh, uh, Montero Water and Sanitary District has historically always relied on outside services and. Maybe that's actually a question for Lou if that was always the case. That's my understanding that as far as we can, <coughs> that, that we know that there was never a, a, a sewer field staff at, at the Montero Sanitary District. There was. There was at one point. For the merger. And Tim's not in yet, yeah. too. For the JPO. No, for, they oversaw the, the pump stations. Um, and we had, a, and there was historically a problem where they caught someone smoking hot water. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for that detail. <laughs> I obviously wasn't aware of that. And I can tell you which houses I know it was probably grown in, having looked at some of them. How would you do that? Because yeah. I tended, I bought them, and I, they were ex-pot houses, and I was going, oh my god, I didn't know there were so many in town. With quite a detail. There was also a private company, which I can't remember the name of at the moment, but you know, Ridge Landing guys that did it for at least Granada and Montero for years. Yeah, and it could have been that they hired somebody else for when Sam. <coughs> Sam didn't exist then, so. Right. Okay. okay, so well then let me revise that statement and then at least since a very long time we haven't had uh, sewer field staff and only employed administrative staff. Uh, that's on the sewer side. Now that we, uh, you know, acquired the water system, we actually, uh, you know, manage an, um, an, an operate operations team very successfully since uh, 12 years. And um, so we had uh, discussions with uh, SAM managers over the years that uh, essentially pointed out repeatedly that SAM collection crews were understaffed in the past and um, uh, now I started an essentially discussion also with SAM management to discuss the possibilities for Montero Water and Modern <coughs> Sanitary District to hire a sewer field staff um, that would complement SAM collections workers and increase the level of service for all member agencies. So this was um, again a, a discussion that I had with um, uh, starting with Steve Leonard, uh, but uh, they were very intense with Rob Hopkins about this topic. topic. Um, the assessment of sewer staffing levels was then uh, put in the district strategic plan, and at the last meeting we were asked to provide um, an initial evaluation of um, what would it take to bring some sewer or all sewer collection services in house. Uh, so we sat down with Newt Engineering, who um, and had some, some uh, long discussions with, with Pippin, and um, uh, looked at this fairly, I think actually fairly closely, and uh, Newt prepared a memorandum that really looks at what is it that we're paying right now for collection <coughs> services? Um, what are the, the categories of service that we get from the sewer authority mid coast side? And um, then provide some really back of the envelope calculations on what would it cost the district to provide those services? And um, I think the results are fairly interesting, and, and maybe Pippin, if you can present your memo to the board, that would be great. Thank you, Clemens. Um, it's been an interesting, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a change in um, uh, staffing level for Monterra, and it would uh, uh, be a, a change in the you know, relationship with Sam. As Clemens um, pointed out, and earlier in the meeting, um, uh, Board President uh, Scott Boyd mentioned that there is a separate contract for <coughs> each of the member agencies <coughs> with SAM. And um, 
it's a bit unusual maybe as JPAs go. A lot of times JPAs, um, they, they just do the treatment plant work and it, take care of their own facilities and they don't uh, interact in the way that this JPA um, was structured where there's this um, contract where the employees can um, uh, be utilized by the member agencies. So um, <coughs> depending on the, the level of staffing um, and the needs of the agencies, that, uh, that level of staffing has to be split. And that's been one of the challenges in the budgets, I think, with, uh, with SAM is that some of those staff are split between the contract duties and between the J JPA standard duties. And, and um, uh, you know, in a little bit uh, more background, when we started the discussion with Steve, there's two aspects here. There's the financial aspect and there is the um, uh, managerial control aspect. And um, um, I think, uh, you know, the, I attached the resolution 9-88 for your background reference, which is worth looking at because this is the current guidelines for which uh, SAM provides service to each of the member agencies. And I'll make note of that title again, Resolution 9-88. So 1988 was the, would have been the year. Uh, so that's been a number of years now since it's been revised. So, um, you know, one possible outcome if it's decided that SAM, uh, that Montero doesn't bring any staff in-house would be a need to revise this resolution to some more current valuations and more current um, <coughs> um, um, references to insurance and liability and, um, and the uh, uh, level of service desired because it's a lot of things have changed in equipment and so forth over those years. So with that background, we explored the possible... One question, yeah. 988, is that, does that affect all three entities? There's three separate okay. uh, contracts. Each, each member agency has uh, a separate agreement they're all very similar, um, and I believe they're all. <coughs> I think they're all uh, pretty much, pretty much exactly the same, same language. Yeah, except yes. and they weren't all exactly signed at exactly the same time, but they're very. I think essentially the same functional uh, requirements, um, and I don't know specifically. It, does Granada have some of their own pump stations? Yeah. One. So. So every, every district has at least one <coughs> uh, a pumping facility and then a, a series of collection facilities. So, so SAM has two general um, types of service they provide. One is weekly uh, uh, observation and potentially maintenance or maintenance which is subcontracted through a, a, a contractor they hire to work on the pump stations and keep them running. And then the other uh, is uh, typically done on, for the most part, an annual basis, with the exception of um, what we call it would be that would be the cleaning and hydro flushing and so forth of the lines. So that's done on an annual basis, with the exception of hot spots or uh, things that need to be done more frequently, or occasionally there's lines which we can extend maybe two years or longer, depending on the, the conditions or the situations. Uh, so those two types of general categories of service: collections, <laughs> cleaning and mechanical pump station um, observation maintenance. Um, there's a third little element I'll just comment on that um, it's sort of SAM driven and is a, a good practices for an agency. Even where JPAs don't do any maintenance of the collection service, there's some um, interaction that has to happen uh, that would have to be worked into the SAM budget somehow to maintain a, a radio communication and dial of communication so those emergency signals can go in both so the plant can understand the flows for their their flow management and also in that desperate need of emergency response to make sure those emergency calls are being made um, so we explored the possibility and on um, page uh, uh, three of the memorandum we looked at just sort of the possibility of <coughs> just conceptually the percentage of responsibility um, broken down very, very simply into just three categories, emergency response, collections, cleaning, and uh, pump stations. And comparing that to what that shift in responsibility might be if Montero were to hire 
two persons for the purposes of collection system cleaning. And um, the numbers I start with there, 10, 61, and 29, those are estimated out of the current um, SAM budget, which is reflective of last year's work hours, because we're always one year, one year and a half in the rears or behind. So 2014 work hours uh, essentially were used for making this estimate. Um, we'd propose that this transition um, would need to potentially need to happen in a gradual fashion. So um, there's a shift of responsibility as the Monterra staff would you know, potentially get trained. Even if you hired expert people, they need to get familiar with the system, potentially buy equipment, and um, you know, so you can't just hit the ground running and tomorrow necessarily uh, you know, change your whole operation. It takes a bit of time to make a, a, a transfer, as well as um, uh, working with SAM as to how their staffing resources would be repurposed. Um, ultimately, what you see with this model is we would reduce potentially the, uh, the uh, SAM participation on this model down to um, pr uh, some emergency response for uh, the critical response utilizing the new larger vector truck, um, those critical events to make sure those, uh, there's response. It's often better to have a little more people <coughs> show up than nobody at all. Uh, what we call USA marking. Um, associated, with, associated with the force mains, there's a state requirement that if anyone digs, somebody has to go mark those lines. <coughs> Excuse me. So we would leave, likely leave that USA marking uh, along with the uh, pump station crew because the force mains are the ones that are uh, required to mark. We've had a history of trying to mark gravity lines as well. Um, it's not a state requirement. It's just a service the district uh, has been providing. But there's a cost associated with it in terms of hours. Um, <clears throat> then we look on the uh, page four. What would happen if Monterra would look at three persons? Uh, one benefit to looking at the three-person model is that when you have that extra person, you have the ability for, uh, if, this, if the employees are cross-trained, to fill in, be more effective if somebody's out sick, or to um, potentially have some of those workers <coughs> with water certifications, which could alleviate um, some of the uh, um, <coughs> uh, scheduling challenges that might happen at different times of year when people want to take their vacations or if somebody is sick or has maternity leave or something like that. So there is a, a, a additional benefit if those people that can be selected have training beyond just the sewer. So again, starting from the same percentages, if <coughs> we were to make that transition, um, the biggest thing there, the biggest change would be to bring the pump station maintenance in-house. And I leave that 3% uh, on the bottom as just a, uh, some budgetary factor where, you know, we, unless Sam were to you know, pay for details like maintaining the radios and whatnot, if they're in our equipment, in our pump stations, we're going to have to pay for those somehow. So um, if Sam is monitoring them um, and, and keeping track of the pump stations, maybe occasionally we need them to wash them down or do something, we'd have to have some, uh, uh, some involvement there. Um, <coughs> on the fiscal impact side, the costs of SAM are comparable to what you might be expecting the district to pay in-house. Um, and uh, actually, since it comes first in the memo, I'll talk about equipment. So in order to make a change to working in-house, there's got to be some upfront uh, purchases. And, you know, we've discussed, you know, there is the possibility of, you know, buying used equipment or things to kind of get, get going, but, you know, there's always risk with buying that. So if you're looking at, at purchasing, you know, say a new flusher truck or, or, you know, pickup trucks, things to uh, provide additional equipment for the staff, there's definitely going to be <coughs> an upfront cost that could range between two to $300,000, depending on the equipment selected in the first couple of years. There may be additional equipment that's chosen, but it, it may not be something you need to put in the first two or, you know, in the first two years, maybe that's something you look in the first five years. A rotter, for example, is a big one. Sam um, 
currently doesn't have any kind of a, a root cutting rotter. There are cutting equipment that can be put on flushers. And the flusher is, you know, where the hose is put in and the water washes down. There are root cutting equipment that can be put on there, and it's fairly effective. Um, it depends on the particular flushing machine you have, how much power it has, and the, and the operators. It also um, um, you know, has some downsides. <coughs> the flusher um, uh, is, is hydraulically operated, so you're not mechanically cutting. <coughs> the, the spinning equipment can stop or you may not have as much control over it. It's higher speed, so it can be more destructive to older pipes, which we have a lot of older clay pipes that are cracked. And so there's always a fear if you, as you say, overcleaned. If you beat it up on the inside, you can cause more damage. So some districts with similar old pipes use rotting equipment, where they go in with a slow cutter and kind of saw the roots out. Um, what we would recommend is that, at least for the first few years, that could be contracted to a private company. Um, which we've actually started doing this year already um, in specific cases where we have areas that the hydroflusher isn't able to cut those roots back. If we were to look at the three-person model to buy equipment, we would have to consider um, an extra um, mechanics truck, which is a fairly expensive item. Uh, a well-equipped mechanics truck should, you know, be able to pull pumps out of a wet well. Um, has quite a selection of tools, and those don't come cheap. So, you know, it's going to be at least you know <coughs> sixty to a hundred thousand dollars to get if you buy it new, a well-equipped uh, mechanics truck. Um, so I put in for reference what Montero is paying for now. Um, on the current budget, if we look at uh, page six, we have the um, uh, a clip out of the uh, draft budget from Sam which shows the hour distribution. And um, the hour distribution is um, itemized per each of the member agencies. So you see Half Moon Bay, Granada, and Montero. So this year we <coughs> had uh, 2,775 hours spent <coughs> in our district. And that's total hours. That would be collection system and, and mechanics hours. And that was a slight increase uh, from last year. And um, some of those other increases <coughs> mentioned uh, in the budget uh, discussion earlier tonight, um, this increase is um, in hours isn't significant, but the cost is. And the cost increase <coughs> is worth discussing because the labor cost has changed at SAM, and it, is, uh, it, it did increase. And um, it's just something to look into the factor if we're looking at strictly as the dollars and cents side, how much does it cost to keep those employees? And with those employees, how much control do we have over them for you know, scheduling? Because there are three different districts asking for their services. Um, <coughs> and then on, uh, I, I compared, um, you know, just we looked at some of the volumes of, of pipes that are cleaned, and um, uh, they average about 100 miles of cleaning per year. So what this means then in terms of um, comparing to the possibility of staff just in a rough uh, uh, look at it is that we have the potential with the budget that's at hand to, if it was the desire of the district, to bring in up to three staff and have a similar budget. It might increase slightly uh, depending on the level of skill of the worker and, um, and uh, you know, whether they have additional water certifications or not uh, that might raise their salary. But the main difference we have is in those hours, we have a different control over the overhead. And um, that would translate ultimately to more hours in the field. So we're currently getting about 2,700. We're projecting up to maybe 2,000. 800 hours next year because we're looking at trying to be a little more diligent <coughs> in some of the tougher uh, to clean sections to reduce um, SSOs. Uh, so potentially though, if we're getting 2,700 hours or 2,800 hours next year, if you did look at bringing three uh, persons in-house, you could, if those workers were 65% efficient for all the days paid, including, you know, maybe some holidays and sick days, and, uh, and, and 
administration time needs to be accounted because not every moment as a worker on site is he out cleaning. He's got duties for record keeping and other responsibilities here in the office. But if they were hypothetically 65% efficient, we'd have 4,000 hours that we could spend in our collection system uh, versus the under 3,000 we currently have. So that's something that's kind of um, interesting to look at when you look at the overall picture. Um, so with that, if you have any questions about the concept or how we approached it. Yeah. So, okay, so the first one is that it, if uh, this was done by employees of Montero Water and Sanitary District, how does that affect uh, uh, where the sort of demarcation line is, that, uh, like for the force main going to the uh, sewer plant, uh, when it ends at our territory, we no longer have any responsibility for it, or is that still SAM's responsibility? How would that work? That's a good question. The SAM staff, uh, the SAM, as uh, mentioned earlier by Scott, the SAM system still has both gravity and uh, pump stations and force mains, which all need, um, need uh, uh, maintenance. And so um, each of those items uh, branch out into the member di member agencies district. So starting even from right here, the pump station just below this office, the facilities as immediately associated with that pump station, the tank and that infrastructure, and the pipeline all the way down. Those will have to, will continue to be owned and maintained by SAM and SAM's mechanics and SAM's collection crew. And when you get further down the system, it transfers to gravity. So the use of that big hydro flusher truck and all of those items are still going to be um, utilized by SAM. Um, there, you know, there's a potential of a, uh, with the same employee level, that if the other member agencies don't utilize those extra hours, the hours have to be spent somewhere. So there's a potential of not realizing all of the savings up front because, or even over the next several years, because those SAM employee hours need to be spent doing something. So if they're maintaining their IPS, um, uh, if all the hours move to their IPS in their plant, we'd see a sh an increase in the general budget of SAM. If the other member agencies decided they wanted to hire some additional service, so they could spend more hours in their agencies, then some of those hours would be shifted to that, to their own end budget. Okay, so that they're still responsible for maintaining the uh, pressure main that's some gravity lines down the, the road, right? Now, is that part of this collection budget, or is it <coughs> part of their uh, facility budget? I believe it's part of the facility budget. The collections budget is specifically referring to the member contracts only. So that's why the, the, the collections budget, which we had seen at the previous meeting, yeah. uses uh, that table, uh, which I have on page six, to do the distribution of cost. So they have a total number of hours they spend in the district. So if you were to add up, uh, uh, they may be, there are more employee hours by all the collections crew than they, ha that they have than are shown here because there's overhead hours, office hours, and so forth. But the, but the agreement states that the payment <coughs> on actual hours will be based on the distribution of percentage. Now, we don't pay, in a sense, we don't pay just for those hours. We pay for the whole employee divided up by this percentage. So we do pay for the overhead. That's why the per hour rate looks a little bit on the high side at $130 an hour. But that's because that includes all the overhead and includes the equipment, except for large capital expenditures like a flusher truck, general equipment maintenance, and all of that is included in this hourly rate. It's not broken out. Okay, so that the... A uh, Valley Mar a uh, project is uh, due to be started. Mm -hmm. Okay, how does that that has no effect on this? That's an altogether separate. Decision. That's an all that's an all together separate capital improvement right. assessment that would be uh, would be uh, uh, the obligation of all the members of the JPA based on their I believe their strict percentage ownership. So if Montero's twenty three or whatever it is, and they're 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 twenty nine and a half. That would be the share that Granada would get to the 29 and a half based on a capital improvement. That, correct me if I'm not stating that correctly, Clemens. That's absolutely correct. <coughs> um, uh, 
maintenance project that's planned on the Viamar line is in the offer should be in the operations and maintenance budget in the sense of operations and maintenance budget. And what we're talking about really is um, you know, from the SAM side, if you look at the collections contract, right, that really defines um, essentially we're, we're outsourcing the cleaning and maintenance, other maintenance items of our collection system, that's really our pipes, excluding the SAM facilities. We're, we're, we're outsourcing that to SAM. And uh, so we're talking exclusively about the um, maintenance of the pipes and pumps that we own and not what SAM owns. Okay. Right. As so just uh, think, think of it as at any of the demarcan demarcation point where it leaves our, the lines that we own mm -hmm. and enters the SAM system, think of everything beyond that point as the SAM plant. And because that's that's what the JPA contemplates, and that's really how the whole thing's supposed to be organized. But the SAM plan is basically, in essence, the facility there and the trunk line that goes from uh, Costa Nera all the way to the... No. No, it starts, no, it starts right, here right here at the walker there. tank. The first place water would go into is the walker tank. A, we should probably get a, an updated diagram. Yeah, we're, we've actually developed a draft diagram. We have some minor revisions based on yeah, it, it gets some demarcation. A and it, it's no surprise um, that it's so confusing sometimes for, yeah. you know, at sandboard meetings. Uh, but, yeah. yeah, I mean, the interesting interesting way to, one thing that's helpful in, in thinking thinking about this is, if I lived in Half Moon Bay, and the plant were up here, we'd be asking kind of the inverse of the questions. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, it's uh, it really is important to know where the demarcation is between what Montero owns and what Sam owns. That's and good, good question. Uh, to answer, well, but, but independent of that, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I, we could probably talk boundaries all we want. But if, what I think you're really asking, you have a recommendation to sort of do the evaluation to decide whether you want to go forward, correct? I think um, Clemens could you know, fine tune his request, but my perspective is what we would need to look a little bit more details into the number and exactly how you would plan this out and implement uh, so, that so and the what trend what would be is what is the what would be trends what is the yeah. goal forward uh, proposal that you would like us to talk about tonight? Okay, so I think the go forward proposal would would really um, uh, much more on the finance side. We have an opportunity right now, for example, with the development of the budget. We, we could literally put you know a, a regular draft draft budget up and then uh, you know a comparison where we essentially add you know the three pair of boots or computer or whatever needs to be purchased to make this happen um, in the in the regular operations budget and also I think get some clearer numbers on uh, what this would mean on the capital side so I think it's it, it comes down to a, a, a better financial analysis. What hasn't been mentioned so far is also that um, the uh, SAM budget is based on a prior years of SAM collect collections budget is based on so the the, the, uh, the upcoming budget the the fifteen sixteen budget is based on hours that were spent in the calendar year fourteen so anything we do. We have to pay Sam for the services that were provided in the year 14. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, even if if uh, we would choose to not receive any further services from Sam uh, starting immediately, we would have to pay for the 14, 15 services. <coughs> not only that, we would also have to pay for at least <coughs> six months of services that we receive in the calendar years 15 in the 16-17 year budget. Yeah. So we're going to have to look at you know a year and a half of having to pay Sam for past services and building up a sewer crew. So essentially paying twice for, for the services. It, it's or, going to look like the elephant moving through the boa constrictor. <laughs> right, I mean, it's, yes. it's obviously not paying twice because right, right, you know, right. we're paying for past services, yeah. but we right. would then have to catch up to pay yeah. for yeah. Uh, you know, the services that we need it'll, to it'll have cash flow house. implications and, and one of the things that I'd like to see in a further analysis is what you know cash flow would look like in the different scenarios 
It's basically, do we want to pull future expenses into the present or into the coming year? That's really what it boils down to. Because it's not like we're not going to pay for the service that we get this year, next year. Whether we, whether it all goes to Sam or whether we split that cost between something we provide and what Sam does. So if to, to, to bring a portion on to us, that just means we don't get to defer that payment right. a year. So back to Dwight's question, I think the, the recommendation would be to come back with better numbers. We would have to do some better math on employee costs, on capital costs. So I, I have a recommendation. I mean, I'll, I'll defer this to the finance, but I'm wondering if this is a specialized project that, I mean, you guys from the finance, you've got the, you've got the 401, you got, you know, you got the discussion we had tonight that has to be addressed, and you've got the finance, the fine, you know, the 2015 budget. So I'm wondering whether this might be a little subgroup that could kind of do this, and then it could be fed back because I think they could be done in parallel versus having to be connected into the total process. Mm -hmm. well, one of, yeah, and one of my concerns, is, and I, I think is, is how this will increase our costs at SAM, because there's a certain um, uh, efficiency by having all three agencies work together. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, I think we need to work with SAM and, and see, in fact, it, and it's tough right now with no general manager and um, uh, at least no permanent general manager, and, and then we're going to get a new one in who really is <coughs> going to take a while to get his feet on the ground or her feet on the ground um, to understanding this. So I'm... <coughs> I'm wondering if if this isn't something we should start a slower discussion on rather than trying to have it hit this year's budget. Well, I mean, well, there's a couple of thoughts here. One is we could do our due diligence to even determine it's worth the effort. And if we decide it's not worth the effort, then it's essentially done. Mm -hmm. If you if you take the time to kind of do the effort, there might be other synergies here that would look at what does Sam do best? Are they better in the collection business versus whatever? I mean, there's a lot of interesting questions here. None of them have to be answered tomorrow. Right. But the due diligence part, which we could start, would pro provide some seeds for you know, a whole bunch of things. I, I, I don't really see any downside for doing the due diligence at the beginning. Realize the complexities, Catherine, you have, because they are. I mean, ultimately, we are part of two other agencies as part of but I think this due diligence could have value beyond just our own way of doing business. And I would support doing the due diligence and maybe have a subgroup kind of look at it and then bring it back to this group for what I call sensitivity discussion as to what's <laughs> in the best interest and then do it that way. Yes. I, I don't see a downside if I, to that, that sounds, whatsoever. That sounds very good. I, if I can just interject really quickly, I think um, this, I mean, this started really. Uh, <coughs> In, in cooperation with Sam, and that is how we want to continue it. So, right. um, however the new management is going to look like at Sam, we want to work closely with the sewer authority and the coast side uh, together on this. Essentially, the, the other point is, um, I mean, my suggestion to plug this in the budget was not to in essentially pass a budget that um, uh, includes this. I think we all have to be aware that. The additional cost <coughs> is something that probably would have to be paid from reserves. So um, that is going to affect our sewer reserves, but it is essentially then a project that can be picked up mid-year and decided on mid-year because if we all agree it should not impact operations budget and should come out of reserve and that would be a recommendation that, that I would make. That would uh, give us a lot of flexibility to push this further down the road. Uh, Jim, I, I'm trying, trying to uh, adjust to the blinking light. Above my the head. the head. strobe <laughs> makes it a little hard. But when it's <laughs> off, you have to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you know something? I, I agree that, that, that we should look at these numbers. <laughs> um, uh, and, and that I think Dwight uh, put it very, uh, very well, very clearly that you know we should do due diligence and then have a sensitivity discussion on the whole of SAM. 
but I, I don't think it should be in this year's I don't think it should be in this year's budget but we should look at the numbers I just want to make the point that um, you know uh, Scott and Catherine have been to the meetings well, uh, and, and, and Clemens knows and, and Tim you know it's been a difficult year um, a couple of years actually we had um, we um, we lost um, we lost we lost uh, Steve Leonard our manager that was a year ago um, you know that was a, uh, a difficult situation a split decision and uh, some of us feel he was doing a great job we lost him then we brought Rob on and uh, Rob we thought was doing a great job until he finally disappeared and left in the last couple of weeks he hasn't been around. He's been doing it from home or not doing it at all, leaving projects unfinished. Um, that was very difficult for staff. Um, um, uh, Tim was Tim is now juggling five balls, j juggling balls, and uh, he's he's being pulled off from operations. Um, it's very difficult for staff. Uh, then we had an interview. Uh, what three months, three weeks ago, we had an interview for interim general manager. And um, that interview uh, ended tragically, right in the middle of the interview. <laughs> well, it did. And, uh, no, not, not a laughing matter yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. It interview in, in, ended tragically. All the board was there. Some of the staff, staff was involved. Um, but to, not cause it. There, there was a medical emergency. There was a me yeah. medical emergency, which you'll hear you'll hear about later, at some point. And then we had an interview last this this last Monday. We had an interview another interim manager. Uh, within a half moon, one of the uh, 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 acquaintance of the one of the half moon bay uh, city council members board members who brought someone in great cv great great resume Started and uh, really and we thought well we're really excited uh, this will solve our problems right now this is just last monday he gets he gets into the first question to talk about himself as you know just describing his experience within three minutes he says you know this is, you know, I, I am really super qualified, but I can only work with, for you as interim manager for half a day, half a day a week. So, so he comes over, he comes all the way over to tell us that. So, you know, we've had just some really, you know, uh, Rob, um, Rob, we have uh, we have some difficulties. He he left. He uh, he didn't. Uh, 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 yeah, no, without, I'm sorry, but he, he has a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, Sam is um, having a difficult, uh, a difficult situation. So I think that, I think that we should um, look at these numbers for the future, but I don't think we should kick a dog when it's down. I think that we should let Sam have a chance to, uh, to, uh, to respond and get back to its um, normal function. Uh, I think that some of your numbers are are <clears throat> are biased because of the last the last December, you know we had some difficulties, and and that was, um, you know that was a that was it was an extremely difficult situation. You mean because of the, the, the flow numbers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the flow numbers. Mm -hmm. You know we had some you know, difficult situation. And it wasn't anybody's fault. Could you do me a favor and figure out which of those switches turns that bulb on? Hey, okay. We'll we'll go a little bit in the dark yeah. with, without the flickering. But anyway, we had a, we had a diff difficult situation. Um, we've had, um, you know, we uh, there, there's some operations problems and uh, there's some uh, short staffing at, at this point. Um, so I think think that we sh I think we should look at these numbers and as Dwight suggested suggested so eloquently, um, can we come back to them in the future. If if I could, thanks. I, if I could. Um, one of the things, Clemens and I have talked a fair bit about this, and uh, one thing I want to really emphasize is, and I, I was talking with Rob a little bit while he was still there, um, and my thinking on, on this since this came up and Dwight suggested we look into this has been, you know, where we get, where Montero gets a few more hands on deck to help out with how tight our operation is here, and so we're able to build out some capability We've got to do it in a way where we don't in any way harm Sam, because that would be, one, we're co-owners with Sam, and that would be counterproductive. But two, it involves people, and uh, we've got long planning cycles. So if we're going to do something, we've got to do something where there's good, clear communication and uh, mutual planning. One of the benefits, if we're able to do this, Sam has been 
kind of over constrained as well because Sam doesn't have a big staff. So there are times where Sam gets in a bind, could use a few more hands. We know from the, the water agency side of things that the mutual mutual assistance agreements that we have with North Coast and with CCWD are there to protect each other should any one of us find ourselves in a pinch. If we develop capacity to where we can help Sam out in a pinch or vice versa, this could work to the benefit of both agencies. And I think what we're looking for is some kind of synthesis uh, where both organizations at the end of the day say this is a better overall thing. So that's that's where I'm hoping we go and I don't think there's anything about I don't think there's anything negative about this at all. I think we're in a position to do something that's really good. Um, it's not something where we can snap our fingers and do it tomorrow anyway, even if we wanted to. Uh, I suppose if Sam vanished off the face of the earth, we'd have to figure something out. But uh, barring something that catastrophic, I think, uh, you know, I know that Jim and I and others, uh, and now Clemens are pitching in, uh, helping out. <coughs> Uh, to try to keep Sam, keep the continuity, keep, uh, keep the staff and the crew uh, supplied with what they need, the support they need, <clears throat> uh, get the extra hands on deck so we can get that back up to full staffing. Um, but if we're going to do something like this, it's got a long enough lead time. I'd like to go ahead and, and finish out the modeling so we can start making the decisions at a policy level about do we want to ramp this up or not. And so we have it, so we can sit down and talk with folks like Tim mm -hmm. about uh, does this make sense? What could we do to make it smarter? Uh, how can we make sure that it's interlocking and, and complementary, not not just one agency's idea? Um, and there's a lot. We got to get everything on the table, and one way we can help with that is to, to get the modeling in place. Um, Catherine was next, and then you, Bill. So. The justification that I have heard for this is um, cross-training for our water, to have water and sewer crew with some cross-training. Um, possibly a more efficient use of our dollars for um, getting what needs to be done in, in an area or in a time of ever-increasing um, uh, requirements on sewer districts to not have spills and not have any problems. Um, perhaps having a staff that is um, intimately familiar with every nook and cranny and every pro potential problem area, not that Sam isn't, but these would be even more so. Um, but the, so those are the pluses. The, the drawback that I see is some overlap of costs, perhaps having to get new equipment, um, maintain that equipment, house that equipment, because we can't keep nice, wonderful trucks on the ocean here. Well, actually, I know there's been some discussion about the possibility of, I mean, Sam could keep its equipment parked wherever it's safely safe to park it and like you take something like dream machines if we'd had a call out situation during dream machines there would have been no getting trucks from sam up to here right in any kind of reasonable time so one of the things that we want to talk about is how do we deploy our resources in a way mm -hmm. that we've got the best ability to respond mm -hmm. so there's I don't, I don't i don't mean to sound like i'm contradicting you because I, I don't think i am it's there's you a are lot of, interrupting. I, I apologize. But there, there are a lot of ways to shake this around, and it's... Uh, you're right, I am interrupting, and I apologize. <laughs> um, so I was just trying to, you know, sort of do a, a quick back of the staff report, pros and cons of, of what's going on. And something that I, we may want to consider as an interim, while staff is, well, well Sam is short-staffed and so on, is maybe contracting out some of these other, uh, some of these functions that we need to have done here now. Um, one of the things that we'll do is, is it will smooth out that financial transition if we are going to do it. Uh, if we are going to go with our own crew, it will allow us a, um, 
in a somewhat limited but but somewhat instructive fashion to see if if that even is something we want to do. Um, as Lou pointed out and, and Leonard pointed out, we did have contractors doing work in um, our district for a long time, and it, it may be something we want to go back to as a, as a starting point. Um, the, the contracting out was um, actually assessed in uh, managers meetings and managers meeting meetings, and uh, surprisingly, uh, the cost to contract cleaning services out is, um, we would have to essentially pay more uh, for the services than uh, what we're paying to send right now. Oh, okay. yeah, we, we, uh, we the, yeah. the geographic yeah. isolation plays a certain role with this. Um, it's, it's not going to be easy to find, find willing contractors that come out. One of, one of my concerns is I don't want to get in the position of, of um, other districts that I have heard of who end up buying all this equipment and then they run out of things to do with it. And it's much more efficient for a Vactor truck to deal with it across three districts than it is to keep it on hand to work in Montero just when we need it. How many times have we needed a Vactor truck here? Certainly not on a daily basis. A Vactor truck, uh, well, or, a Vactor or, truck has many uses, so you can't just specifically say, you know, a Vactor truck. I mean, you can use it to clean out your lift station wet wells. You can clean, you know, use it to clean out grid chambers. There's different things you can use it for, and the Vactor, I mean, it's a combination truck. It's also a flusher truck, right? So 90% of the time you're going to be flushing, but there is that percentage. But we wouldn't need it on a factor. daily basis or even necessarily a weekly basis here in... Um, in if... <laughs> <laughs> I'm again, I don't this really this want to... This could turn into a long conversation. Yeah. Well, 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 clearly we better... Know where you we're having lots of fun, fun yeah. engineering and operations tonight. Well, uh, uh, well, uh, we'll have to talk later yeah. then. It, uh, to, Flusher trucks are cool. Uh, I think oh, it comes down to that. The yeah. short answer is... Look, guys, I like toys yeah. just as much as it's you do. It's a big, yeah. giant vacuum cleaner yeah. that can lift up asphalt. I've <laughs> watched them at, at the North County. County. So what's the short what answer? What's the short the, answer? The, the short answer is if you, get, if you had your own truck, yeah, you could use it every day. I mean, it, it could. if you went from one end of your system, flushed everything <laughs> all the way around, and you start over just like... Golden Gate Bridge mm -hmm. painting. Really, that's what you would be doing, because the ultimate goal that you're trying to reach is to have zero discharge out of your system. Right. That right. is the ultimate goal. Yeah. And if that requires the frequency of your flushing in your system to be increased more to achieve that goal, maybe that's what you need to do. That being said, the overflows that we've had in your district. If you look over the past 12 months, there has been a decrease in the number of overflows that we've had in the district, which is a good thing, right? I mean, that's really what we're trying to do, prevent the overflows and protect the receiving waters and obviously the public health also. But, so the short answer is yes, if you had your own truck, you could do it and you would probably end up doing your system more frequently around the hole as you are now. But that being said, uh, Sam has recently, um, and soon we will getting, be getting the new truck, and we recently hired an additional collection crew worker. So we are going to have two trucks on the road now. So that's going to increase the frequency of the flushing and the cleaning and the factoring of the lift stations to help prevent any issues that we have with pumping issues in regards to the pumps at the lift station, increasing the life of the pumps at the lift station by removing the debris that could cause excessive wear on the pumps and everything further down the line as it goes into your system and makes its way to the pump station and ultimately to the treatment facility. So hopefully that will help. So when we talk about our I don't want to overstep. When you guys discuss um, contracting, I, I think I think you you need to look at 
the possibility that we might be premature since we are getting the new truck and currently we are you know achieving the goal of having less overflows and the work is getting done is the work getting done to the level that you want or the expectation that there is um, I don't know obviously um, I think it's a conversation. A it's itself, it's a conversation we'll have, yeah. and I and I'm grateful. And I'm grateful you're here to to listen to all this too. And that was the short okay. answer. <laughs> that was the short answer. So, yeah. I, and I, I thank you very much. I, you know, it's, there's a lot I think that this board needs to hear to make a good, a well-informed decision. All right, Bill. Okay, do I have the floor now? Yes. Okay. Seems to me that to, we need to do two tracks in this. One is to do the due diligence so as if we were going to run this ourselves, mm -hmm. okay? But the other track is to uh, negotiate a new contract. You know, basically, <coughs> this contract expires in 90 days at any given point in time, right? So that once that contract expires, we have a uh, perfect right to renegotiate that contract. And I think we would be uh, sort of remiss in not taking that approach at the same time. You know, because it's sort of a little bit what you're talking about is trying to work cooperatively with uh, Sam. If if we can work something out with them, I think we should pursue that line of uh, uh, effort also. I think there's a lot of latitude in the current contract for our general manager to, to work with Sam to decide just how much work is done. I don't know that there are ultimately any real flaws in the agreement. It's it's more a matter of the, the level of service that we request. Well, the, it was done in 1988, so obviously... Yeah. No, it, it, sure, yeah. we might find it, some way to tune it up. But, yeah. Yeah, but I, I still think we should uh, go down that road at the same time <coughs> and, uh, uh, because uh, both of them seem to have some merit to it. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's been a lively discussion. Uh, if you're ready, uh, we have one Item one, one member of the public who wishes to comment, and for, uh, for the audience who was watching, um, Tim, who was on camera just a couple of minutes ago, uh, is one of our one of our leaders at, at Sam. He's it's uh, <laughs> one of the one of the uh, two most senior people that we have there, I believe, uh, running the crew, running the cruise because we've kind of. We're dividing and conquering. Tim has responsibility for one of the groups, and, but right now is wearing many hats and uh, uh, works pretty hard. And has been with Sam for, oh, I don't remember how long. You really want to know? Yes. Started part-time in 87. Okay, it's been a while. Uh, so Tim, was, Tim knows our system. Was that a grade school project? <laughs> That's when you went on the, the Half Moon Bay High tour with uh, Barbara Wobie, right? I think he signed this so, yeah, I think he did. So, but anyway, uh, that's who was speaking, and uh, he really knows his stuff. Uh, Leonard? Good evening. Uh, I, I think I remembered the name of the company that used to do it. I think it was probably CSMS, which is the same company name that Rich Landy still has. It was like Coastside Sewer Management, something or other. Um, and, and Rich told me a couple of years ago that, that he could do it cheaper, but it's largely dependent on getting contracts from all three member agencies. It's harder for them to beat the price to just a single member agency. Um, a, a little bit of history. Uh, at, at one point, I don't remember what year this was, Dixon decided to cut the SAM budget um, in a three card Monty setup where he. Um, tossed the collection system maintenance back to the member agencies to cut the SAM budget. So yeah, all right, it cuts the SAM budget, but it increases the member agency budgets in some way. Uh, and that went on for a few years, and then it came back to SAM. Uh, I think most of that happened before I was on the board. Um, now, something that I'm not sure everybody knows, uh, Steve Leonard, uh, I think it was Steve Leonard, recommended um, that all the member agencies take it over and contract it out themselves and instead of contracting with Sam. Uh, he said we could get it done cheaper um, that way. Uh, and by the way, somebody said 100 miles a year cleaning. I think the total system is 100 miles, which is pretty interesting. Um, 
kind of hard to follow Pippin when he knows so much. He understands us so much better than I do. But the one, the, the one thing I want to mention, he, he referred to capital improvement. We, we've been struggling over that term for a number of years at SAM, and now it's capital maintenance items. Um, so, um, oh, I wrote cash flow, and now I forgot what that was all about. Oh, cash flow. I've never understood why we don't pay monthly, you know, why it, it's done annually. Because if we contract out privately, we're going to be paying monthly. So, you know, that's, that's something to revisit if we decide to redo those contracts. Um, and, and by the way, Sam does not have a garage. The, all the equipment there is parked out in the open. I actually had a brief conversation with Rob, and I think Tim was in on it, maybe not, um, uh, about, you know, can we find a place on the Sam property to build a garage for the new truck, which we're spending a ton of money on. And the answer is, yeah, we probably can do it. You know, we'll have to cough up the money to do it. Um, uh, and, of course, burying the lead, think about evaluating your numbers with the idea in mind that maybe Granada would contract with Monterra mm -hmm. to do our system. The, the one thing you would need is a really good root cutter, because <laughs> that's our biggest problem in Granada is roots. Um, and you know that might work out. It, it, it potentially could make your um, you know how many staff you would need to add. It, it might make that balance out better. I don't know, but it, it, something that, that uh, I, I think that you should think about and potentially have uh, uh, Clemens talk to Chuck uh, about it because you know that that might work out, and then. Um, you know, basically, that's that's half of the the SAM collection system maintenance, roughly. So, uh, I I look forward to hearing from you on that as to whether that might make sense. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let's go on to new business item four: uh, review and possible action concerning filing notice of completion for 2014 sewer improvement project and spot repairs. <coughs> So this was uh, a project that we entered into with Pacific Trenchless in uh, uh, pretty much one year ago. And um, we now received a letter from the district engineer that uh, indicates that the work has successfully uh, completed. And um, it also recommends the, uh, to, uh, a notice of completion to be filed with the county recorder. Uh, there's a 35-day lien period. After that, then a 5% retention that has been withheld uh, will be paid to the contractor. Uh, the recommendation is to authorize the general manager to file the attached notice of completion with the county recorder. Any comments or questions? Can I have a motion? So uh, second. Thank you. Dwight and Jim, moving and seconding. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, Motion carries four to zero. Note that uh, Director Slater Carter stepped out of the room for a moment. Uh, new business item five, review and possible action concerning review of refund policy for private water leaks. So uh, the district has a, a water refund policy that essentially allows uh, refunds to excessive water usage due to leaks in private plumbing. <coughs> Uh, what we also have is a sewer service charge uh, <coughs> refund policy, and I don't think we should confuse that with the water policy right now. Um, the sewer policy essentially says that if a leak occurred outside, then um, there, there, there could be a reduction to the sewer service charge because that water was not treated. So let's leave that sewer policy aside. Let's focus on the water policy. The water policy essentially says that there is um, a uh, refund that can be given for excessive usage due to un un unanticipated leaks. And uh, what we have seen historically is that a high percentage of water leaks occur in outdoor irrigation systems. Uh, it's true that we um, also find a lot of indoor leaks, toilets leaks, but those are usually fairly easy to detect. 
um, and don't lead to the uh, high amounts of water loss <coughs> that we see in outdoor irrigation systems. Outdoor irrigation systems can fail uh, in, in points that are essentially unobserved, can go on for a long time, can be underground in a wet spot, not <coughs> noticed. <coughs> and uh, uh, we had a recent discussion uh, here, and I know that uh, we, I just talked with uh, President Boyd about this, who essentially suggested to consider revisions to the water refund policy uh, to essentially reflect the new realities of these strict water conservation standards that are currently being asked um, all throughout California. So the recommendation is to review the current water leak refund policy and suggest revi revisions. So is the one that's here, is this the one that's proposed or the one that... That is the one that is, uh, is still in effect. We normally would pr prepare a proposed one but didn't get around to doing it. I but, but, but I, what I'd like to suggest is, I, I asked for this item, um, given the hour, what I'd like to suggest is Take it home, think about it. My thoughts on this were pretty simple. Um, we've had we've had several people come by over the past few months. They've had problems with their outdoor irrigation system. I know after having talked to Clemens that that our crew helps homeowners identify you know where their systems are, how to shut them off, how to identify leaks, and so forth. Um, <coughs> But I don't know that we've had a good conversation with the community about the kind of risk that an outdoor irrigation system can, you know, poses to the homeowner and their budget and to the system because of leaks. Uh, it's been a while, but I remember one leak in an outdoor irrigation system that went on for weeks and it was just flowed nonstop. And I, I forget what the total amount of water was, but it was amazing. And it could all have been avoided if that system had simply been shut off at the primary valve. It would have been very, very easy. So what I'm, what I'm more than looking to provide people a a financial incentive, I'm, I'm most interested in starting the conversation with homeowners in our community about how to know whether or not you have one, how to know whether or not it's turned off, at, you know, do you have a main cutoff for it, do you need to use it all the time? With our new water restrictions for outdoor watering, it's probably time for people to be reminded, go find it. Make sure it's shut off if you're not planning to use it. Because as much as we like having people come here to visit us during board meetings, it's much nicer when they're not coming with a big bill. You know, we'd like to help everybody avoid that. So that's the thinking. I'm looking for something positive that lets us engage with the community. Uh, and provide some constructive information for them. If we're able to have that conversation, then I'm wondering whether or not we need uh, the refund policy that yeah. we have right now, at least with respect to outdoor irrigation systems. Um, so that's, it's more food for thought, and I'd like to bring it back when uh, staff has had some time to think about what we might do to actually propose something. Does that sound fair? That yeah. was my suggestion, thank you. Okay. Uh, by the way, Clements, I never got a copy of the several things that are on the uh, agenda. They, they just didn't seem to appear in my copy. There's, uh, well, there's two of them. Actually, there were two lines. So if you go to the second one, that's what. The, so you have to go to the second one, and then the rest the of the second, second comes packet. Okay. Yeah, okay. Second there, packet. There are okay. two lines on the thing. That's what. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, new business item six: review and possible action concerning rebate increases for appliance rebate program. <clears throat> okay, so the uh, rebate program uh, that the district has, and I'll explain what it is, has <clears throat> um, literally saved millions of gallons of water and, and really helped reduce the per capita consumption. I think that's really the reason why we uh, were, one of the reasons why we're get, getting those numbers down so uh, significantly. Uh, of a very effective rebate program in place. Um, and uh, it hasn't been updated since uh, at least four years. Uh, and when we updated it, we actually did not revise any of the actual um, dollar amounts that we issue as rebates. Um, so just to give the, you all an understanding of what our other agencies are um, doing for rebates right now, um, up and down the coast side, 
for um, clothes washers, there is a um, $150 rebate that um, essentially all um, Bausta agencies issue. However, that is now um, a uh, rebate that is essentially coming directly through PG&E. So there is a, um, an agreement with PG&E set up where you get one rebate. And if your water agency participates, instead of $50, you get $150. So in essence, being um, in, in, this, in this pool that participates um, gets you from the water site $100. We are better off than those agencies because we issue a $150 rebate and anyone who has uh, purchased a you know, water efficient clothes washer and that also is energy efficient receives on top of the $150 a $50 rebate from PG&E. So there's a total of $200 in rebates to get from uh, the public agencies for you know, um, these uh, efficient washing machines. So I think those numbers uh, are very good, and I don't see that we have to increase this. On the, um, uh, we also offer currently a $50 rebate for low-flow toilets, and that's in our, uh, in our uh, program defined as a 1.6 gallon per flush toilet. And um, uh, that is, uh, in essence, what our neighbors to the north offer currently. Our neighbors to the south are offering a $100 rebate, provided that the um, toilet is a one point modern 1.28 uh, uh, gallon per flush toilet. And we recommend, in essence, to double the amount of money that will be given for a toilet from $50 to $100 to essentially match what our neighbors to the south are currently doing. And uh, while that sounds like a lot of money, the overall budget for our rebate program is, um, Peter's not here right now, we can, we, uh, it's actually on the capital side, we have to look it up, but it's, it's $4,000, it was $4,000 last year. And uh, so we're in the $4,000 range when it comes to rebates. This is minimal amount of money when we look at how much water is really saved. And uh, encouraging Wait, folks- we could add that to our only water twice a week. <laughs> Only flush twice a week. <laughs> no, well, no, that's not a good idea. But, no, but increasing I, I that's not a good idea. <laughs> increasing our our yeah. rebate program oh, is okay, a positive. Absolutely. Okay, so we go to a hundred dollars a week. The specification changes from one point six to one point two. Yes, that is the suggestion. Okay. So I, let me let me note that we've been saving a ton of money by not having a conservation. Uh, conservation officer, uh, CCWD has a staffer, or did, I haven't checked in a while, but they have they've had a staff position for someone who does conservation uh, work, uh, for working with the community and teaching people how to do this. We, we don't spend that money. I think providing incentives for people in the community to take these steps on their own is a really good thing, and I'd like to see a lot more of it. That, let me just mention really quick that we have staff that went to classes for water conservations and um, we're uh, currently uh, actually encouraging other staff to get certified mm. as uh, water conservation specialists. So we don't have to pay the big bucks. Um, our, our staff has the knowledge and we currently can provide right. water audits throughout <coughs> the district as well. I, I have several suggestions. One, or question, <coughs> Can we keep the $50 for switching to a um, 1.6 and then as well as offer the 1.28? Some people might have some concerns about the problems with these ultra low flow, low flow toilets. And then what about the ones with the two buttons, the P function and the solid function? How do you, how do those get accounted for? And Maybe we should have $75 rebate for one of those. I'm just pulling numbers out of my head. And, and what about um, a rebate for moving to the um, ultra-efficient dishwashers? The old dishwashers used a whole lot of water, and well, the new ones are much more efficient. There is, as far as I'm not concerned, uh, uh, as far as I know, 
there are some water saving dishwasher features when it comes to commercial dishwashing machines. Uh, residential dishwashers, I see energy efficiency is available, but there are no water, there are numbers on what they, what they, uh, what the amount of, of water is that they use per, per wash, but there are no certificates. As oh, there are I'm no certificates, okay. That, you know, qualify them as <coughs> water efficient. Right. Um. Okay, I'll, I'll look into it a little bit too, but um, okay. I, I, because I'd like to encourage folks to move to as many if more efficient um, machines as possible. But again, it, it, the dual flow, the dual push, and the and the maybe keeping the one point six, I don't see that because it's still more of a savings than the five gallon, the old five gallon ones. But the old five gallon ones you can't buy anymore. You can't go buy those anymore, and a 1.6 you can probably pick up for $50 nowadays. Um, I'm not sure if that's really true, but I'm pretty so, so you can get those for under $100, the 1.6. Yeah, but you'd still want people changing from the older toilets. There's still a lot of old houses around here. No, we do. We want to encourage people, for sure. Yes. So. I mean, my recommendation, I mean, consumer reports actually come out with some really effective one two or the one two eight or whatever it's called. And I think the old days, I, actually, they had more problems with the one sixes when they first came out, but that's all been resolved. Yeah. I, I would recommend you do the one two. I think the technology now is such, Catherine, that uh, those days of things not going down because of the issues of the technology are over. And the, the double in the incentive might be just to try so. I, I, but I think it is also a good idea to, to include that with the, whatever we uh, publish about water restrictions. You know, mm -hmm. that, that I think put the, make, make that part of that communication. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So you're gonna you're gonna check into some stuff on uh, dishwashers. Yeah. yeah. Do you need a motion um, on this? Yeah. Uh, well, I I would like to. Um, Yes, I would like to get a, a get, we need a motion. I would like to get at least direction to increase the amount to $100 provided the water used per flush is at or below 1.28 gallons. Yeah, so moved. Is that second? All right, it's been moved okay. and seconded. Uh, any further questions, discussions? No? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, motion carries. And we just bought a new washing machine because our old one gave out over the weekend. And uh, I'm not disappointed at all that we didn't increase the, the rate for the washing machines because I didn't realize we had such a good rebate. So I'm looking forward to this. So uh, uh, go return it and buy it next week. We yeah. thought it was not that, we, we thought it wasn't that old, but it turned out our, the one that failed was 15 years old. So, um, and we've been enjoying it. It was a front-loading washer, and it's a washing machine, and it's been uh, saving us water for all that time. It's been great. Uh, all right, report. Sewer Authority make Okay, we had, we had a meeting. Uh, we had a regular meeting on Monday, April 27th, and uh, we talked about a few things. Uh, as uh, We have an expert here on this process, and that is we talked about San Mateo County Resource Conservation District first flush. Um, water quality monitoring program and um, so when, when the first rain comes volunteers work with the, the RCD the resource conservation district to go to certain sites on the creeks to take samples to see what's coming down in, in the first first uh, runoff what kind of bugs and bacteria and viruses are being flushed down and so um, uh, um, the uh, the first flush sites were um, were uh, excluded Half Moon Bay, so Half Moon Bay asked that they be included. Uh, so at a cost of, uh, <coughs> uh, I think five thousand um, dollars, they they will be uh, I think five sites in in Half Moon Bay. So uh, so that will be part of the uh, Resource Conservation District project at, at for first flush. Um, you say Half Moon Bay, you're specifically saying corporate look. Yeah, half the, day, the beach, the yeah. surfers beach, okay. uh, south. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, and then the other thing was um, uh, uh, our SRT consultants. Um, we finally got going on, on recycled water. SRT consultants gave us an update on um, 
on uh, applying applying for grants, what grants we can apply for. The uh, the board voted to uh, to uh, have. <coughs> I think I think it was. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, Scott will refresh my memory, but was well, one of the board members talked to uh, Dave Dixon, or maybe it was Tim, I was, uh, I'm not sure who it was, but someone was assigned to go to talk to CCWD and, and get recycling um, a discussion on their, their, their part in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, 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 in mm. the first part of it, which is supplying golf. Uh, uh, we're going to need to pick a new person, because that was Rob. That was Rob, yeah. okay. So uh, Rob, uh, I, I, did, he, did he talk to Dave Dixon? I don't know if he did or not. Uh, I don't believe we've heard. I, so think, I, think, I think we should just yeah. plan on having the committee. So out. anyway, so, so, so someone's going to be approaching Dave Dixon about recycling water. Um, Might for, 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 for phase course. one. Yeah. Yes. For, for phase <clears> one. Um, do you want to mention um, we allocated the money for right. SRT to refresh the report from 2009. Right, right. Yeah, we, we, I think how much, do you remember how much we, we Yeah, we out, not to exceed 15,000. 15, so it's a, a nominal amount to, to bring it up to date. Um, if you get a chance, uh, the meeting is uh, on YouTube, and her presentation, I think, was very good, very informative. Um, had a lot of good information about uh, what kind of funding is available right now, and there's Nothing like a crisis to make some emergency funding available. So, um, sewer authority mid coastside meeting of uh, Monday a week ago uh, had a, a very good presentation on recycled water. So, if you are interested in recycled water, that was Monday a week ago, right? No, uh, two weeks ago. We've we've had occasion to meet every Monday night for the past three <coughs> weeks. So. Yeah, I get yeah, all turned up. April 21st? No. The, the, April, the April Sewer Authority mid Coastside meeting had a... It's all, it's all worth watching, especially the uh, slideshow about um, about recycled water. Uh, so. I'm sorry. No, that's right. That's it. No, thank you. That was it. Um, I, I want to take a, a moment just to mention something. Um, we mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, we had a candidate come. Uh, to meet with us to talk about uh, possibly being an, an interim general manager for us for a little while. And during the course of, of that interview, uh, that person suffered a heart attack and um, a few days later uh, passed away. Um, I don't think any of us in public service has been in a situation where we've seen that happen during a, a board function like that, but um, it, uh, it's a very serious situation and um, I, everyone at the meeting uh, found some way to pitch in and be helpful. Um, uh, we called Coastside Fire, they, <clears throat> they came out uh, with the ambulance and provided a uh, very good, quick, professional uh, response. Um, I want to commend, uh, we had members of our staff who rode along to the hospital to make sure that this person who was from out of town that had somebody there to make sure there was a good handoff and to uh, be able to do, uh, reach out to uh, that person's family. Uh, it was, it was just a, uh, a tragic situation. Um, but I would just, just need to know, uh, it happened. Um, I was very, very proud of, of how everyone uh, found some way to be helpful in that situation. And just we're just very sad that it didn't turn out any better than it did. So, okay. um, Mid Coast Community Council meeting. Let me see. I believe I got a, uh, the big wave <laughs> is going to be heard. I believe on May nineteenth. <clears throat> If not the 12th, I didn't read the date real closely <coughs> today. Why is it? I believe it's Board of Supervisors. I thought they already approved in the Coastal Commission. They didn't appeal to the Coastal Commission. No, it's going back. Um, it was a notice from the county. Um, they are working. The, and um, also, there's this plat traffic plan. It was at the uh, Cypress Meadows for Connect the Coast. Um, 
people, I, I would recommend that people look into this uh, the, as, as it has been presented. Um, it appeared there were going to be stoplights and uh, road widenings and um, <coughs> I'm not, I think people need to be involved to make sure that they get the kind of highway one that they want as opposed to that we will, what we will be given. Um, CSDA report, I'll just jump into so, that. So what's the status of that, Catherine? Where does that stand? It's they're coming back with another report. Another report. Okay. After they heard from the community. Um, the community was pretty outspoken to the fact that they did not think that what the county was proposed, what, what the uh, consultants were proposing was going to um, help. As a matter of fact, there were several who mentioned that stoplights tend to slow things down and there were a number of requests to look for um, uh, roundabouts and other ways to move traffic instead of stoplights. Any flying elephants? Uh, no flying elephants, right. but um, the flying elephant air traffic control person was there. The, the, the county survey also presented a very large number of false dichotomies, and they took flack from a few people uh, on that one. Anything else on the Coast Council? Nothing. All right, CSDA. The CSDA, we had our meeting on Tuesday night. Our next meeting will be August 4th. Um, Dave Pine had been to us several months ago and created, uh, is working on creating a community choice aggregation with three flyers, um, group that will be comprised of the, uh, cities, uh, the county, and I managed to get special districts involved in this, um, and so there's going to be a meeting once a month for about the next 16 months um, at the uh, fairgrounds in which they will be talking about creating, investigating whether to create and if it's feasible how to create and what kind of structure to have for the CCA, CCE. Um, so for the um, Special District Association, uh, Jim Harvey, or yeah. Our, our, we are going to be, not Jim Harvey, I'm sorry, Harvey Rareback. Okay. Don't look so shocked, Jim. <laughs> it was the Harvey that got me. Um, uh, Harvey Rareback and I will be sharing that um, position. And one of the um, mandates is to make sure everybody knows what's going on on this, and so that's Certainly my intent is to make sure all of the special districts and the uh, public on the coast is well informed of, of what opportunities and challenges are in front of us. Maybe you need to explain what CCA means. <sighs> here, I can read it right here. Why don't you community do? Choice Aggregation. <laughs> it's the Clean Energy Customer Choice Community Empowerment. Uh, it's a, it's a non-profit agency that uh, provides options for buying power and where you can choose how much green energy goes into the mix. You may want to check out green.smc, as in San Mateo County, smcgov.org, smcgov.org. One of, one of the things that they will be looking for is, is ways to encourage <coughs> um, more alternative and green power. So I'm going to be working to make sure that we can um, <coughs> find ways to encourage cities and special districts and, and the county to put in more uh, solar and other forms of, of uh, green energy. And I'd love to be able to find a way to encourage more rooftop yeah. solar, more a greater yeah. distribution of the uh, resources. If you'd like to see how a CCA works, you can Google Sonoma Clean Power. And they've got a website. They've got one that's actually up and operational. All right. Um, CCWD, NCCWD committee report. Um, not really. 
report. Nothing reports good. Uh, I think we, wanted, 10 we wanted you guys to schedule actually a meeting. Yeah. So okay, that sounds great. Right. I, I let, it, let us know when you have one scheduled. Okay. Yeah. All right, attorney's report. Oh, yeah. All right, director's reports. No, general manager's report. Nothing. All right, uh, future agendas. No, okay. Um, hearing no objection, we are adjourned at 1031. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.